Okay, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Oregon Transportation Commission meeting. Today is Thursday, June 20th, and for many of you, you will know that today is the last Oregon Transportation Commission meeting for our beloved director, Matt Garrett. So I am going to hold my comments to the end, and um, we will have a couple of things that we would like to present to Director Garrett. Um, so I, uh, for all of us, or maybe I'll just say for myself, for the emotional um, comments that I would like to make and keep my composure, I will offer my own self a bit of grace to the end, and I suspect I might be speaking for others as well. So um, Director Garrett, with that, we will carry forward as our usual business, and I will turn it over to you for your director's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that opportunity, and I would appreciate any brevity in any comments that may be made later. <laughs> But with that, we have business to do. And what I'd like to do is begin today with what I would consider a Southern Oregon project trifecta. Uh, I want to first take us to Medford, where uh, on May, uh, in the month of May, the Oregon 62 Rogue Valley Expressway was open to traffic. Now, construction was completed over a three-year period, but this was a project that was spoken to in Medford the greater Metford area for nearly 20 years. Uh, the 4.5 mile four lane expressway runs from the I-5 in Metford there by the airport, if you're familiar with uh, uh, the great city of Metford, to just about White City. It improves safety and reduces congestion on the busy Crater Lake Highway corridor. It was a $120 million investment with the majority of that, about $100 million coming from the 2009 Jobs and Transportation Act. And the uh, professionals at Knife River Materials and Central Point were the contractors doing that piece of infrastructure work. Now the benefit of the investment, it takes off about 30% of the through traffic uh, off the uh, Crater Lake corridor, cuts travel time by about five minutes, specifically for the freight community here. And on opening morning, we received the following thank you in an email from the traffic manager of F.V. Martin Trucking, Stu Davis. Mr. Davis says, selfishly, this is a great addition to the Rogue Valley, especially for our local dedicated trucks. As I rode with a couple of my drivers this morning, the new road will save us on the wear and tear of our equipment. Now, the good folks um, from Martin Trucking, they run about 85 trucks a day between White City and Medford, and they anticipate they will save more than $300,000 a year just in freight costs alone. This is just one example about how transportation investments touch many, but more importantly, leverages economic health for the state of Oregon. So we moved from Medford to Grants Pass. I want to speak about the Caveman Bridge in Grants Pass. ODOT and the community celebrated the facelift of the Caveman Bridge, one, to Condi, one of Condi McCullough's true gems uh, that he was responsible for. And I have been told that it looks just as it did, if not better, than it did on opening day in 1931. Now, part of the re rehabilitation project included new bridge rail, new period lighting, repairs to the cracked concrete, and then we uh, put a little thin coating and polished it up to make it look light and bright. Now, complementing the bridge repair was the rehabilitation uh, and the completion and the unveiling of the City of Grants Pass Redwood Empire sign. Originally erected in 1941, it was part of the early days of marketing highway tourism from Grants Pass to the Oregon Caves to the Redwoods to San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge. It looks uh, close to what it was when it was erected in 1941 and it's just off the bridge approach. So a marriage of two opportunities there. Our ODOT historians Chris Bell and Larissa Rudnicki assisted the city in researching um, and providing the narrative associated with the significance of that sign. Now, rounding out the trio of events and keeping with the tourism theme, let's drop down to Ashland and the Siskiyou Safety Rest Area and Welcome Center. The long-awaited Ashland Welcome Center uh, on I-5 at our state's border was opened on June 7th. I had the privilege, uh, along with Todd Davidson, the tourism director, of sharing a few remarks with good folks that gathered down there. 
And I'm proud to say that the Siskiyou Rest Area and the Welcome Center stand symbolic, symbolic for what can be accomplished by perseverance, by cooperation, by negotiation, and partnership. And there's a young lady in the audience uh, who wears uh, the Department of Justice uniform, but she looks good in the ODOT uniform when, she, when I have her put it on. Bonnie, can you stand up? We often speak about the men and women of ODOT and our local government partners who work very closely, sister agencies working very closely to deliver projects, but we seldom mention folks who are behind the scenes. Um, this was a project that was 20 years in the making, and it was an extremely heavy lift. Um, we have navigated through, you have to stand up, Bonnie. <laughs> we have navigated through both calm and choppy waters. And I will tell you the hand on the will during those choppy waters, finding pathways forward in terms of heated debate, legal saber rattling, was our Bonnie Heitch. And Bonnie, I want to call you out and thank you for staying the course. I can say with confidence that Bonnie's work as well as the robust discussions, the debates, the disagreements that were part of this journey actually made this project better and has, and has given the traveling public a safety refuge and a state-of-the-art Cascadia-themed facility that will be an information hub and a welcoming oasis to those traveling into the great state of Oregon. It will be ta uh, uh, staffed by Travel Oregon professionals and we have a little port in the storm for OSP folks that making sure everybody's playing by the rules. I want to congratulate Bonnie. You can sit down now, Bonnie. <laughs> I also want to congratulate Frank Reading and the Region 3 professionals. Congratulate the citizens of Southern Oregon, specifically those good folks from Medford, Grants Pass, and Ashland. These projects, they affirm the essence of our mission, that ODOT provides a transportation system that truly connects people and helps Oregon's community and economy thrive. Madam Chair, I want to stay with the theme of acknowledging people. Um, there must be something in the water up in Region 1, because over the last several years, Region 1 women have been honored with awards for their outstanding professional achievement and for supporting women and minorities in the field of transportation. I'm going to speak about Mandy Putney, who secured the 2019 Women in Transportation Seminar Woman of the Year Award. But I want to walk through the litany of professionals that we have the privilege of working with up in Region 1. The Daily Journal Commerce Women of Vision Awards, which honors women in non-traditional fields, including has, has identified and included former Region 1 traffic manager Sue Dagnese, um, and last year awarded Tova Peltz, our Region 1 Project Delivery Manager, with this Journal of Commerce Award. In addition, the Women Transportation Sem uh, Seminar presents awards to women for outstand outstanding contributions supporting the hiring, mentoring, and advancement of women and people of color in the field of transportation. Last year, Sh Shelley Romero uh, from Region 1 was honored as the WTS Portland Chapter Woman of the Year. This year, as I said, Mandy Putney secured that honor. Now, if you don't know Mandy, I will tell you she is a consummate professional with an accomplished background in public policy, project management, program funding, strategic communications, and public involvement. She is the total package, um, and the good folks in Region 1 are blessed to have her wearing that uniform. She is a solution a solutions-oriented individual. It is her mindset, it is her disposition, it is her approach, and she is always working to develop options or courses of actions that satisfies the interest of all parties involved in whatever transaction that she is engaged. So to all those women up in Portland um, in the, our Region 1 offices, we are blessed to work alongside you work alongside these talented women and certainly very proud that their accomplishments and their contributions are being recognized both, both at the state and the national level. Now, John Baker. It looks, Madam Chair, I'll tell you, you look at that, that, uh, that wall right there and it looks like old timers day for the federal affairs 
uh, uh, position here at the Department of Transportation with Mr. Tell, Mr. Brower, uh, and now Mr. S uh, Sleeman uh, holding down the fort. And I see my friend Matt LaRocco, who does our bidding back in Washington, D.C. It's good to see you, Matt. Um, but I want John Baker. John, raise your hand. I want to share with you um, something about a, a true gentleman, someone who represents the best of the Oregon Department of Transportation. John is retiring from this agency after 33 years of service. I will tell you the first person I met, um, I was in a different position. I had the privilege at the time to work for United States Senator Mark Hatfield. And the per first person I met from the Oregon Department of Transportation was John Baker. And we had a conversation about an air traffic control tower at Roberts Field in Redmond. Uh, and John helped me navigate the ODOT aviation conversation here. Uh, and if you've ever been out to Redmond and you've seen that beautiful facility, um, John's fingerprint is on the air traffic control tower. Now, hugging that air traffic control tower was a young woman by the name of Carrie Novak, but that's a completely different story. Um, Are you well, it might have been. It might have been. Uh, but this was 1996, and I walked away from the meeting talking about that air traffic control tower and the opportunities that the senator had to work with ODOT and the FAA to secure that. But I walked away with, boy, that was a nice fellow. He was a true gentleman. He knew his stuff. He was prepared. Well, that hasn't been lost on very many people who have worked with John P Baker, and that includes the Honorable Peter DeFazio, uh, Chairman of the Transportation uh, Infrastructure uh, Committee at, in the House of Representatives. And Mr. DeFazio took the time to read into the record a tribute to John J. Baker. I will not read it all, but I will read three paragraphs of what is a very articulate uh, and meaningful statement. So Mr. DeFazio begins, Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize one of the unsung heroes of public service in Oregon. Mr. John J. Baker has ably served the people of Oregon and the Oregon Department of Transportation for over 30 years. A transportation economist with a deep background in the federal aid highway program and its formulas. Mr. Baker's work has benefited major transportation projects and communities across the entire state of Oregon. Mr. Baker's creative work with federal funding formulas helped support many legislative decisions that resulted in millions of additional federal funds for the state of Oregon. Similarly, his intimate knowledge of federal transportation grants and grant making process has helped bring untold millions in grant funding to the state and to local governments in Oregon. Mr. DeFazio, and it goes on, uh, but I'm going to read the closing paragraph. The Oregon Department of Transportation will suffer an irreplaceable departure this month when Mr. Baker retires. Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues to join me and all Oregonians in thanking John Baker for his long and dedicated service to the people of Oregon. My home state is immeasurably better, a better place because of Mr. Baker's contribution. Simply put, Oregon would not be Oregon with people like John Baker, without people like John Baker, Baker, I should say. So with that, John, I'd like you to come up here because our crack staff has framed that message that's in the congressional record. And Madam Chair, I thought it would be appropriate if you and I had the privilege of giving this to John. Get right here. Madam Chair, I have one more item I want to share. 
I'd ask Commissioner to stand up, but he, I know what he would tell me, so I won't do that. Five years ago today, Commissioner Alondo Simpson began his tenure on the Oregon Transportation Commission during one of the largest, loudest, and longest public comment hearing in ODOT's history. And he came back the next month. But notwithstanding this trial by fire, in five short years, he will soon become, come September, the senior most member on the Transportation Commission. Now, Commissioner Simpson challenges this agency to uphold its responsibilities and its obligations to challenge the status quo, to promote critical thinking and use measures, use data, use metrics as a way to shape and transform sustainable transportation policy. Through his words and his actions, he has developed, he has reimagined, and he has refined concepts and initiatives in an inclusive, transparent manner and challenges all of us to deliver those assigned tasks as effectively and efficiently as possible. Commissioner Simpson, you remind us that now is not a time for modest ambition and that we need to summon courage and intelligence to resolve today's challenges and prepare for the future opportunities that come our way. I want to thank you for the many qualities that you have generously shared with this commission. And simply put, we are a better organization because of your presence on the OTC. So it is my privilege and my pleasure to award you with this sterling, civ sil sterling silver five-year service pen and service to the Oregon Department of Transportation and the Oregon Transportation Commission. Congratulations, sir. Madam Chair, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for allowing me just a little more time to share those thoughts. With that, I will stand down. Director Garrett, you may have as much time today as you would like. Just let us know. Uh, and uh, you can inform any conversation anytime you would like. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next agenda item. For all of the good folks that are here today. I'm just checking them off. Well, I'm just checking them off. Okay. He's not getting it quite yet, but he will. <laughs> so, yes. Could you get to the tip of the spear, please? The tip of the spear? Why, yes, the tip of the spear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I say we lean into this agenda. Okay. <laughs> It will be a robust conversation later this afternoon. So For all intents and purposes. <laughs> well played. Well played. I, I'm, I'm glad you picked my favorite picture, too. I mean, it's just outstanding. Like the tongue kind of hit Yeah, just I was getting a shot at the time. Okay. Next item is public comment. And I do not, I have not checked my phone, Cooper. I, where, okay, we don't have, it's, okay, but I'll just go ahead and cast the net. Would it, okay, please, yes. Um, wonderful. And I would ask that uh, before you head out, please sign the sheet, and that way we have it captured <coughs> for the minutes as well. Um, wonderful to see you again. Go ahead and hit the button and so that it turns red, and state your name for the record, and you have three minutes. The floor is yours. I think it was on for just a moment, and go ahead and, Sometimes it's a little persnickety. Wonderful, there. The My name is nice. Roberta Robles, and I am here to request a um, health impact assessment on the state transportation improvement plan. Okay. So that was coming out from what the discussions were prior, and so I wanted to bring that forward. That was my idea, was to have a, a health impact assessment on that. And then prior to that, um, Van Brocklin, I mentioned earlier that part of the disaster relief issue that I saw from 
my perspective from being around the world quite a bit is that it didn't seem like there was a clear chain of command when there was an emergency. So what we experienced in, um, in other locations was that they identified if it was an emergency issue, like an earthquake, then ODOT would be in charge. If it's a tsunami, maybe the Coast Guard is in charge. So that's all I would suggest is that you have a clear line of like communications along with it. And so, and then I'm gonna switch to my personal reason why I'm here is I'm requesting a complete moratorium on auxiliary lanes in the Portland region until the Portland region can figure out what they're doing with congestion pricing. I believe there is a lot of money to be saved on these auxiliary lane projects if we use congestion pricing. And so um, I am concerned that additional taxes on gas and applying it inside the, super, the highway fund is um, not what we need to be doing. And we need to be um, seeking um, I divestment or a diversification in sources of money for the highway fund. And this is a known issue, and it was outlined in the, sec um, the treasurer, Tobias Reed, in his letter to the legislator on House Bill 2020. He identified the absolute need to diversify our funding sources for the highway fund. So if we can combine that inclination with a moratorium on the auxiliary lanes in Portland until congestion pricing, I don't believe we need the gas tax reference on House Bill 2020 and that some of the cost savings could be administered through the Oregon Department of Transportation to reduce our overall greenhouse gas emissions. And so while I haven't had a time to go through all of these projects, um, to me, it feels like we should be shifting our priorities to tourist facilities on the coast. And then um, I have a lot of other ideas, but I'm just gonna stick with those for now because that's the most important and germane to the time we have right now. But we really don't need a freeway auxiliary lane into the Harriet Tubman Middle School. These children are already sick and experiencing behavioral issues. There's environmental toxins there already, and it is not fair to put another lane in our playground. Thank you very much for joining us again, and thank you for joining us this morning. I think you did a great job tying all of those topics together, and um, we share your concerns that have been raised, especially around um, the Cascadia and ways in which we are investing in health impacts and the work that we do every day. So thank you so much for your commitment and involvement. Would anyone else like to approach the commission on any item? Okay, so we will move on to item C. And this is a discussion with our Federal Highways Partners. Mr. Ditzler, please join us. And this is in reference to the Federal Land Access Program. Gentlemen, great to see you. Madam Chair, if I may, please. Uh, while the, these gentlemen um, get seated. I'd like just to maybe do a little preamble and then turn it over to Phil and, and Ricardo. I remind the Commission that the goal of the Federal Land uh, Access Program is to improve transportation facilities, um, public highway, road, a bridge, a trail, or a transit system that provides access to or adjacent to or are located within Federal lands here. Um, we have a um, a group of folks made up of the Oregon Association of Counties, the Department of Transportation, and Western Federal Lands that are charged to set the policy, the framework uh, for the program, uh, the FLAP program, including uh, clarity of authoritative, uh, authority delegation, collaboration concepts, performance expectations, oversight obligations, and opportunities to better integrate and leverage other federal and state programs with the FLAP program. Um, I think we have an opportunity. I think today's conversation will be an overview, but I think at, at its core as we look to the future, we have an opportunity to reflect on the status uh, quo, so to speak, on the mechanics that we have in place for this program, its investments and its outcomes, and take that to inform the future of the program here. And I think that's why 
uh, Administrator Dissler and uh, Administrator Suarez are here to share some thoughts on that. So with that, Madam Chair, I would turn it over to Phil and Ricardo. Thank you, Director Garrett. Uh, Chair Bainey, Commissioners, Director Garrett, uh, we very much appreciate the, the time on your agenda here. Uh, I am accompanying uh, Ricardo Suarez here uh, in this discussion. And so uh, Mr. Suarez, he'll make a presentation and then uh, we'll, we're open up to, to any questions you may have. And then we'd like to just say a few words uh, uh, with regard to Director Garrett and his departure. So. Uh, with that, I'll just turn it right over to Ricardo Suarez. We're having some moonlighting, apparently. <laughs> well, the machine turned off. Now it's trying to turn off. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Chair Bainey, uh, Director Garrett. Good afternoon, and thank you for providing this opportunity for sharing information on the Federal Lands Access Program in the state of Oregon. I want to take the next few minutes, just give you a quick overview of our organization and why we're here. The establishment of the Federal Lands Access Program, which is a significant federal program in Oregon. Uh, talk a little bit about the Federal Lands Access uh, Program distribution of funds and current operations. And then uh, spend the rest of my time here for a couple of minutes talking about uh, an improvement initiative that we recently uh, kicked off with, uh, with the support of the entire party that uh, is involved with the program that uh, Director Garrett just mentioned. So. Uh, with that, I'll just go ahead and uh, jump into the presentation. And that's right here, right? Okay, so that'd be the next one here. Okay. Uh, first of all, I work with Federal Highway Administration. We, we belong to the Federal Lands Highway Office that resides within Federal Highway Administration, and we operate within the U.S. Department of Transportation. For Federal Lands Highway Organization, we provide financial, technical, and project and construction contract delivery services for federal and tribal public, public roads. Uh, our, federal, our, our core business is to effectively deliver uh, these programs that provide highway tra and transportation facilities on or serving one-third of the United States that is federally owned. We also provide complete asset management uh, services for uh, our federal partners, and that includes a complete inventory analysis and helping prioritize uh, the support of uh, how, how we proceed with uh, programming our projects. So three core programs have to do with what's in the federal estate, and that's Federal Lands uh, Transportation Program, and that's a program that's funded at $365 million a year. So those are things that go entirely to provide uh, services for the system within the federal estate. We have the Tribal Transportation Program, and that's at $444 million a year, and that's obviously to serve um, all transportation needs uh, within the reservations. And the last program, that I'll be talking about that for the rest of my time here, is the Federal Lands Access Program, and that's $265 million nationwide program. So the Federal Lands Access Program, it was established under MAP 21, and it was reauthorized under the FAST Act. So it looks like it's going to be a sustaining program and uh, one that we can look forward to working with here in Oregon for a long time. The purpose of the FLAP is to improve federal lands access on transportation facilities that provide access to or adjacent or lo located within federal lands, serve high use recreational sites and economic generators within the federal estate, and complement the program that's delivered within the federal estate recognizing the importance of safe access to and within federal lands. It's a formula-based program, and there's a little graphic there on, on the formula and, and how those funds are actually distributed. So the flat distribution to Oregon. The, the, the picture there depicts um, the, the flat program and how it's distributed nationwide. So. Oregon receives the largest flat allocation in the nation. It is the largest program in the United States that, that's geared towards serving um, what's happening within the federal state and making sure those connections are being made. Since the inception, uh, through last year, Oregon received $170 million. Current annual program is around $34 million. The significance of the program the funds received is very important for your awareness and our accountability. In large part, that's why I'm here today. 
that point. So how the flap operates, uh, it's administered by the Federal Lands Highway uh, Divisions, and we have three of them. And here uh, in Oregon, it's, that's administered out of the, uh, our Western Federal Lands Office in Vancouver, Washington. The whole operation is guided by sta statewide agreement, which identifies representation, agency roles and responsibilities, legislative and regulatory authorities, and policies on how the, this program will be coordinated. We have a program decision committee. That committee includes one representative from Federal Highways, the state DOT, and someone from the Association of Oregon Counties. Uh, that committee also develops a multi-year program of projects in consultation with applicable federal agencies. Each project is uh, that's uh, selected through this process has, has, has to enter into a project agreement and uh, prior to receiving those funds and certainly prior before NEPA starts, uh, it includes things like a scope, schedule, budget to make sure that uh, everything's taken care of and we're not entering into something that uh, has uh, extenuating commitments beyond the original intent. Then it, it, agency roles and responsibilities and match requirements for the program. I do want to take just a couple more minutes and talk about an improvement initiative. We had a kickoff meeting um, a couple, a couple, few weeks ago, and uh, I really want to thank Director Garrett for providing that opportunity to have this discussion and continue to look for ways to continue, uh, continuously improve the things that we do, especially in the state of Oregon. And given the significance of this program, things that we can continue to evolve in terms of learning from our past experiences and looking ahead in terms of what we can do better. And we had uh, initial meeting, and that meeting included uh, Director Garrett, uh, <coughs> Mac Lind, uh, Gary Farnsworth, um, uh, Brian Worley, uh, Mike Eliason, uh, Phil Ditzler, uh, and myself. There's a couple other people there, and and we we talked a lot about uh, you know about moving ahead with this initiative, and some things that that I wanted to share with you in terms of why we're doing this is to ensure the integration of this program within the broader transportation discussion in Oregon. Ensure that project selection and delivery aligns with program purpose and your statewide priorities. That's why we're doing this session. <laughs> we want to do this because it's the right thing to do in Oregon. It's, it's the way that we see moving ahead with sustaining the program for Oregon and keeping this the largest program in the country and growing it for the future. Um, I wanted to share that with you and we're gonna be spending the next few months with the individuals that we just mentioned, uh, gathering around a table and sorting things out in terms of a way ahead and a better way ahead in terms of securing uh, uh, the health um, and vitality of this program for the future. So that's, I uh, wanted to share that with you. And I certainly look uh, forward to a period somewhere down the road, whether it be six months or a year from now, that uh, from my accountability standpoint, as an administrator of this program to report back to you on how we're advancing on our commitment on this improvement initiative in the state of Oregon. I did want to talk a little bit about uh, something that has inspired me the last couple months through this process and it was something that uh, Director Garrett mentioned early on in the value of partnerships and he spoke about through that value of partnerships how things actually work in Oregon and they work very well in Oregon. And we want to continue in that spirit and um, appreciate what you did to help set us off on that. And we're definitely going to be looking at those partnerships and putting them in place so that uh, it does work to the benefit, not just of the program, but for everyone here in Oregon. Uh, and we know how much uh, in Oregon you have uh, federally owned land and uh, some of the recreation benefits that come from that. Um, and we're here to try and serve you as best we can along those lines. So with that, I appreciate that opportunity. Before we get to, were you transitioning, Mr. Ditzler? No, we're just opening it now to any questions okay. you may have with regard to the FLAP program. Wonderful. 
Uh, so I have, um, so as you may know, I served as a county commissioner for 12 years, and so I'm fairly familiar with the program, but not as detailed as, of course, our road department manager at the time, or director. Um, you know, I really, I appreciate you noting it, that we do in Oregon like to celebrate our partnerships and make sure that that is, I mean, it's really, especially when you get outside into some of the more um, isolated areas that are considered more rural or even frontier, being able to rely on one another and be able to have uh, mutual aid and be able to deliver projects together and do that work, planning and et cetera, uh, really is one of the things that we've hailed as success. And so I, I think that um, what you've highlighted is change. And there, uh, I also appreciate that you had noted that there will continue to be additional conversations. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of, of the considerations that came to me um, through conversations with colleagues is um, making sure that whatever changes occur, um, not only uphold that partnership uh, spirit, but also making sure that we are uh, recognizing the capacity and the uh, challenges that small, smaller communities across the state of Oregon have in being able to um, deliver projects and being able to, the certification processes that we have. And, um, and then also making sure that we, um, with House Bill 2017, um, we had had the governor's visioning panel prior and going around the state and hearing what mattered most in all corners of the state of Oregon. Um, Preservation and maintaining the system itself as we have today, making sure that we're doing those appropriate um, applications that keep the system whole, if you will, is critical to the success. Um, you also noted, you know, Oregon, over 50% of the land is publicly owned. In my own county, it's 78% of the land. And so many of those roads lead to beautiful areas that are accessed for recreation and, and then want to get into the forest areas. Um, so I think that's a long way to get to. I would like to understand a little bit more about the prioritization around preservation maintenance and, and enhancing the system that we have. Is there a process that you're using in order to be able to have that discussion and, um, and just your, your thoughts on what that looks like? You know, my thoughts is, uh, one is that the, with these funds that are coming in, making sure that we do a better job of this integration component with statewide priorities. Okay. And, and that's one of the big things that I think that uh, I think the existing process that we have, they've what's happened has been a, a great job with what was provided to them. And I think now what we're trying to do is do a better job of informing and what's happening statewide. Are we aware of those and making connections so that we are complementing the efforts that are happening within the state and in the federal state and then with the access program that's trying to connect both, excuse me. So I think from I think we're a long ways to getting to uh, what types of projects we're looking at. I think all types of projects are on the table, and it's through how we best use those limited resources as we work our way through that process. And how do things surface? Be it a preservation project, uh, be it some other road that that needs maybe some more heavier reconstruction needs that that do provide uh, uh, maybe uh, some critical access. Those would be things that we'll be discussing along the along the way. I think this is a program that's you know six years. It's still that, that sounds a long time. It's still in its infancy, so we're still trying to work these things out and um, how we best meet the, the the as you mentioned. If you get to the whole life cycle or service life of a roadway, there's going to be a number of things that you have to provide to to reach that service life, which includes preservation treatments. And we just we just need to know how we're going to get there, and then at the same time, do the all the other things that we need to do on those roads. So uh, they've not been eliminated. It's everything's on the table, and it's how we're going to get to the the right things that we need to do. So okay. I know that's a long answer, but no, no, uh, no, it's an important just, one. I think can. it's um, you know for smaller communities that uh, are impacted that partnership really matters and clarity in terms of what priority looks like. Right. So I think what I um, look forward, what I hear you saying is that there will continue to be additional conversations with community partners and that there will continue to be a dialogue about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And I just would encourage the conversation right. to include making sure mm -hmm. that the smaller communities in the outlying areas of the state are not adversely impacted by those changes. And if there are changes that are coming on, that there'd be an mm -hmm. opportunity to phase that or to um, truly understand them before making any significant changes. Okay. 
And you have two great representatives, and Michael and Brian. And Brian, uh, in fact, I just spoke with him just before coming in here, and the first thing he brought was bringing to my attention on, in terms of the, the county level and some of the things that are going on. So, and uh, so they're a big part of it. I know Brian right now is a, a big active uh, player in these, this discussion. He sits at the table, Wonderful. and he's influencing what's coming out of this. So. Well, change can always bring about a little bit of uncertainty, and I know uh -huh. that the partnership has been strong, and so we look forward to that remaining mm -hmm. the same. And I appreciate your commitment to making right. sure that we consider all of those factors. And um, so thank you for the dialogue and extra time. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Okay. And Chair Manny, if I uh -huh. may, I just want to also <laughs> add that uh, over the years, uh, and I know I heard this from Director Garrett, that some of the work that this, this program kind of replaced the forest highway program and then expanded to include other uh, federal land management agencies. But prior to that, you know, we've had a long partnership working with the Oregon DOT and, and others. And, it, you know, over there, it wasn't a very transparent process. Let's just put it that way. It was things were happening. Uh, I know I've heard uh, Director Garrett at times mention that things were happening and it was good things, but not necessarily uh, awareness of those things that were happening. And I think that's part of what's driving this too, and I'm not saying it's not happening, but we want to make sure it is happening. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line here, is that this federal program be as transparent as possible and integrated with the rest of the things that are happening here. And I heard that loud and clear over the years, and I've heard it again, um, and I think that's, that's, that's the big step that we're trying to do right now. I suspect you're also hearing about the Secure Rural School Funds and that those continue to dwindle, and so your yeah. partners out in the communities that are trying to deliver projects are struggling, and um, so being able to preserve the system with chip seal and, and being able to make applications that'll uh, preserve that asset is critical to for both the community members as well as to federal highways. So um, I appreciate your commitment to making mm -hmm. sure that those uh, priorities remain in this in the same and if not in this program that you would continue to make sure that there's a priority and other funding revenue sources that would be able okay. to bring that forward. Thank you. Please. Madam Chair, if I may, I, I, I think that last statement really captured um, what I took away from the meeting when I sat in this day of foyer and I think that the Secure Rural School Funds are whole chessboard to leverage the investment revenues that we have here. And I find an interesting symmetry because we are meeting in the Gail Ackerman uh, Commission Room, and I will tell you many times Gail sat in a, not quite this setting, um, where there was a frustration, to your point, that it wasn't transparent and it was outside. And at the time, I think the, the amount of the program was probably about $24 million but the inability to connect the dots, to ensure that the activities that make an impact to the state of Oregon weren't being leveraged. And I think there's a nice symmetry that we have this conversation knowing that we are crafting a future to ensure just that, that we are leveraging and better aligning the revenue streams of the state of Oregon, of the federal government, no matter which program they come in, we bring in Phil with some oversight protocols and discipline, and I think we are lifting the veil. But most important, we come around the table and we continue the conversation. Uh, and that was my takeaway mm -hmm. from the conversation. And I think it, it, it allows us to deal with chip seal. There were a couple chip seal issues. We really had two transactions. One, a forward-looking transaction that we speak to today. Mm -hmm. But the real-time opportunities on projects that were, for all intents and purposes, uh, on idle, but had and would make significant impact to some of our central Oregon um, counties here. I think we cleared that conversation with a recognition that that is a useful tool and an appropriate activity and we will continue the conversation as we move forward. And to Ricardo's last point, everything's on the table. All of us need to come back and reimagine the opportunities that we have to optimize a program. Um, and the last thing we want to do in any way is diminish that, that contorted map. We want all the federal money come to the state of Oregon. We want to maintain that protocol. We're certainly well placed here, Mr. Ditzler, Mr. Suarez, um, but also our congressional delegation sits uh, to help protect uh, those investments that do good for the state of Oregon. So Madam Chair, I thank you for that time.
Thank you very much. Very Mr. Good. Yes. Okay, and so with that, uh, Mr. Suarez and I would also like to recognize Director Garrett upon his departure from ODOT. Uh, and so we have a couple of items here. Uh, FHWA's admis Administrator Nicole Nason uh, has uh, acknowledged uh, Director Garrett with a Public Service Award. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, just read the letter from Administrator Nason uh, to you, Director Garrett, and then present uh, you with a, a plaque uh, from FHWA. So with that, um, uh, Nicole Nason writes, Dear Mr. Garrett, I am pleased to present you with the Federal Highway Administrator's Public Service Award. This award acknowledges your outstanding contributions in delivering the Federal Aid Highway Program in the State of Oregon. During your 22 years of public service with the Oregon Department of Transportation, you worked closely with the Federal Highway Administration to balance the needs of both state and federal interests in the delivery of transportation services. Throughout your career, you have built a strong relationship with the wide range of transportation <laughs> stakeholders in the state. You have served as the chair of AASHTO's Committee on Environment and Sustainability, and you pioneered ORGO, the nation's first operational road usage charging program. In addition to your work with AASHTO and ORGO, you were key in developing several state transportation programs. In 2016, you led the delivery of the Oregon American Recovery and Reinvestment Act program. In 2017, you led delivery of the Keep Oregon Moving State Transportation Package and the Oregon Transportation Investment Act Bridge Program. You led countless strategic highway research program and everyday count initiatives. You created Connect Oregon, the state's first multimodal investment program, and you implemented a context-sensitive context practical design delivery process. We sincerely appreciate your strong partnership with FHWA and your years of dedicated public service. Your dedication and professionalism influenced the way FHWA administers the Federal Aid Highway Program. It is through the efforts of committed and exceptional professionals like you that the U.S. transportation system continues to be the best in the world. Sincerely, Nicole Arnason, Administrator. And with that, Matt, I would just like to say that, uh, you know, when I think of Director Garrett, Matt Garrett, you know, a couple words come to mind. First and foremost, it's leadership. Uh, Matt, the way you inspire people, the way you inspire action, uh, second to none. I, it's, it's amazing how you will motivate people and inspire them. Uh, and the humility and grace in which you conduct business. Uh, your integrity, your moral compass, uh, the respect you show for others, and the honesty and trust in which you engage uh, in a conversation and in dealing with issues. Um, FHWA cannot thank you enough. We appreciate the partnership uh, that you have had with us and uh, what you have done for the people here in Oregon, uh, the employees of ODOT, and our nation. So on, on, on that note, we thank you and we'd like to just very quickly present you with the plaque. life after <laughs> <laughs> yes okay so next item on the agenda is an update from our chief auditor um, Ms. Hartinger and then we also have Mac Lent who's going to join us and talk about the internal audit on the statewide transportation improvement program oh and Mr. Strickler I'm sorry okay. all right okay <laughs> and am I Marlene, shall I turn it over to you? Sure. That'll All right. All right. All right. Oh, it's up to you. I like that. 
Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Director Garrett, thank you for the opportunity today. We wanted to uh, bring to you two very coincidental items, frankly. So that's uh, both items that you see there labeled as D. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge a few things in the room. Uh, one is that as you look around the audience, you have uh, every region manager here, as well as our statewide delivery team. You have the leadership of the highway team really here to kind of listen to the feedback uh, answer any questions that may come up throughout this process, uh, but then also provide uh, any context that you may need as we go forward. Uh, what I have in, as far as an introduction, and I wonder if we can pull up the, the slides that we had. And we'll go to the next one. So this is the only one that I'm going to walk through before I hand it off to uh, uh, Mr. Lynn and Ms. Hardinger. Um, what you have in front of you is something you've seen several times and it's probably not something to dive into um, for today because you've had many opportunities to look at it. But what it is is that it's a series of tasks and much more and that's the part that I wanted to take a moment uh, to describe for you. Um, it's much more than that series of tasks that I described. It's actually kind of a cultural aspect of the way we're doing business and the way we're doing business going forward. I think you've heard before what you have in front of you is a culmination of many years worth of process and questions uh, and improvement opportunities that we've had within the division as we deliver projects for the great state of Oregon. Uh, but then you also have a real intensive effort that really started in March leading up to what we have today, which is a pretty significant opportunity for us today as we bring forward something for your consideration. Uh, that cultural aspect, I wanted to make um, just a few comments regarding if I could. Uh, one is as you look to some of the kind of past decisions, past processes, and, and past work efforts that we've been in as an agency, uh, what you have is a culmination of a series of intentional decisions. You have things that, um, frankly, were one way of us doing business as we were moving through the improvements uh, for the infrastructure within the state of Oregon. And frankly, there was a lot of logic to some of the decisions that were made in some of those previous uh, kind of decision-making processes. Uh, we were intentionally kind of introductory as it relates to our scoping efforts so that we could apply more uh, intent and more delivery and more thought uh, into our project development process as we went forward. Uh, and what you found is that that provided us many opportunities to be in front of you. Uh, and those opportunities really were on a project by project basis. Uh, and it really spanned a myriad of amendment opportunities for the step cycle that we're in. As the demands of the industry, frankly, demands around us, the public, uh, and responding directly to the questions that we've received from the Commission, as those demands have changed and created a new opportunity for us, what we have is we have in front of you, like I said, that series of tasks that really equates to kind of a cultural shift in how we develop our projects. Our project development process will bring improvements, and like I said, I won't go through all of them on the screen there, but those improvements really are intended to bring a higher level of certainty and precision and uh, a new way of learning and developing projects much, much earlier in the process, earlier in that scoping phase. This should bring many benefits. One of those benefits will be uh, a cleaner and clearer recognition of what available funds might be in future phases of a long step cycle, for example, or even multiple step cycles as you start to add them uh, back to back. And that uh, that increased certainty, I guess, um, will also increase the level of transparency and the ability for us to then plan for that future a little bit better. So that's the goal of what you see in front of you. So I guess the one thing that I would ask uh, as we go forward, uh, before I, I, uh, I do turn it over to the two professionals sitting next to me, uh, is as we're asking the tough questions of ourselves, as we're asking the tough questions of those around us in the industry and reflecting on our contribution, and also not being afraid uh, to really recognize this cultural shift that we're in and creating the change as we move forward. You've got the team behind me here that is actually ready and willing to do that and they've been doing a great job to date. Uh, they've been doing a significant amount of intense work uh, to really get to this point. And I ask that we still have opportunity to come back and continue to grow and continue to improve by way of this commission, by way of internal work product, by way of uh, continuous improvement advisory committee, we want to have those opportunities, especially throughout the next year, as we're developing the next step cycle. All of these are intended to improve that future step cycle so that we, again, have the opportunity uh, that I think you've been asking for, which is a, a, a programmatic view of what we're delivering as a state. So with that, I'll stand down and turn it over to Mr. Lynn. So just real quick, uh, for the record, Macklin, Deputy Highway Division Administrator, I just want to set the stage. We split the items on the agenda 
because of the actions we'll be asking you to take. Um, but in terms of our approach here today, we'll certainly uh, turn it over to Ms. Hartinger here in just a second to highlight uh, what is a great opportunity for us to look at some recommendations coming out of a recent audit. Uh, and if we needed any um, proof that we need to work on our project delivery effort, uh, we'd look no further than what she's going to talk to you about. So we'll end her way in terms of the recommendations she's going to share with us. I also want to daylight and remind, excuse me, remind the commission about some of the continuous process improvement efforts that are already underway that you've heard about that Mr. Strickler just referenced as well. Uh, the bulk of the conversation with you all today will be around our stiff rebalance effort as we look to calibrate the remaining projects that are in the 2018-21 stiff and some other factors beyond that. Um, and as we shift, shift to transparency and reporting, also talking about our House Bill 2017 projects and how we're uh, focused in our reporting and transparency on the delivery of those projects, as well as how we manage, if you will, the performance of our STIP delivery at a programmatic level and what tools we're working to put into place. So at a super high level, that's what we're planning to accomplish here with our time with you this, this afternoon. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Hartinger to speak to the okay. audit now. Looks like my slide is up. Um, Chair Bandy, members of the commission, for the record, my name is Marlene Hartinger, Chief Auditor for the Department, and I'm pleased to be with Chris Strickler and Mac Lynn today to highlight the results of our audit of the STIP amendment process. Uh, this audit was identified as a priority in our 2018 2019 work plan um, and as you're aware project delivery has been a key focus of our audit efforts over this past year and this uh, audit of stiff amendments is our second in a series of project delivery audits so some have been out more to come on that um, we looked at the stiff amendment process to determine whether it had a measurable impact on the timely delivery of um, project completion uh, initial concerns were that the process was causing delays and what we found however was the opposite uh, the STIP amendment itself was not um, having a significant impact on project schedules. Uh, rather, our audit identified other contributing factors, and these factors are foundational items such as how the STIP is built and controls for project scheduling and funding. Um, to reach these conclusions, we analyzed STIP amendment data for 800 amendments that were approved uh, for ODOT projects in 2018. We also did an in-depth review of 49 uh, um, amendments for 49 projects. And additionally, we sought input from individuals engaged with the STIP amendment process, including uh, STIP coordinators, project leaders, and planning managers from across the regions, uh, the statewide STIP coordinator, our program and funding services unit, as well as partners from Federal Highway and Federal Transit. Uh, we made several recommendations that uh, stemmed from our work for the department. Uh, the first is to review the process for building the STIP and how programming decisions are made with an eye towards whether changes are needed for setting the project schedule and funding. Additionally, uh, we recommended that uh, the department review project controls for scheduling and funding during the project development stage to determine if additional rigor is needed. And lastly, uh, we recommended that the department work with stakeholders, including the Metropolitan Planning Organizations, the Commission, uh, and Federal Highway, to look for opportunities to further streamline the STIP amendment process. And in regards to this last recommendation, I wanted to highlight that the report includes uh, information about other state practices. Uh, we looked across eight states that are similar in size to Oregon in terms of federal apportionments uh, to compare STIP amendment thresholds and the level of uh, engagement by state transportation of boards in approving the amendments. And we are providing this information for the department and commission's consideration. We wanted to thank and we appreciate the engagement of department personnel throughout this audit. And we especially want to um, appreciate the improvement efforts that are already underway that will be uh, shared by Chris and Mac. Um, and lastly, a copy of the report is provided in your packet for your acceptance today. And uh, with that, um, I, my presentation is complete. I'm happy to answer any questions. Which has been an ongoing discussion for us is how we better engage our metropolitan planning organizations. Mm -hmm. So has there been a discussion about the audit findings and about the opportunity for us to strengthen that alignment? Um, and if so, how is that going? And if not, is that on the horizon? Yeah, so Chair Bainey, absolutely. In fact, during the course of the audit work, there was already efforts underway, specific with the MPOs and our Program Funding Services Group around better coordination around project changes, mm -hmm. STIP amendment processes. 
Um, so that work uh, and is reflected in the report and our management response of efforts that were already underway, uh, which I think build nicely into some of the recommendations coming out of the report. Continue to refine that, and I'll speak to that a little bit later when we get to the step rebalance about that partnership we have with the MPOs as they manage the portfolio within their region and, of course, as we manage the portfolio of the state. So continuing to refine that relationship. I think the big piece that uh, in the MPOs are focusing on as well is how do they select projects. So recall, they operate much like you in terms of the selection and funding of projects as well, but most of them in my opinion, none of them are delivery agents, right? They are the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. So I know a number of them are working on their own improvements to their selection process and confirming scope schedule budget, much like what we're seeing in this audit report, as well as our continuous improvement efforts that not only will help us, but will help our partners as well. If I may, since we're taking these in two separate items, would it please the commission to potentially consider the receipt of this audit report? And then we'll let Marlene uh, maybe step back away from this. Wonderful. So I'd welcome a motion. I'd love to give you one. Thank you. There we go. So moved. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Marlene, yeah, and thank, thank you. you for your great work. Perfect. Uh, we will move on uh, with other parts of the presentation. So, uh, Chair and uh, Commissioner Simpson, you are the two on the commission that may remember this slide, uh, but I put it in there because I call it the, the snake graphic. Um, in February of 2018, former Highway Division Administrator Paul Mather was in front of the commission uh, briefing the commission not only in our project delivery process, but also on setting the stage for improvements. Uh, those, that conversation uh, for all accounts was the initial salvo into leadership and organizational changes, bringing David Kim on board and establishing the statewide project delivery branch as well as splitting out the chief engineer responsibilities now under the leadership of Steve Cooley, as well as recognizing that we needed to make some structural and procedural changes, uh, much to Mr. Strickler's comments in the beginning about how do we front load the work efforts uh, as we scope and select projects uh, rather than bringing them late in the game, if you will. Uh, while that structural change is certainly uh, important and it's one we've been working on, the cultural aspect of that is going to be uh, even more intense. And uh, to Chris's comment, uh, the leadership in the room today supporting that direction. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, culture eats strategy for breakfast, and we know uh, regardless of what tools we put in place, that's the piece uh, that's going to make us successful. Uh, I will tell you anecdotally, there's a lot of energy right now, uh, especially with a lot of our new staff around what kind of project controls and processes we're putting in place as they're coming in as an experienced workforce with other background and educational experiences. So uh, certainly the goal of increasing uh, transparency and accountability, uh, but an effort that we've been well underway for quite some time now, uh, culminating in where we're at today with uh, the next topic. So as we turn to the calibration effort, uh, these are some stats I'll run through, but I wanted to set the context for you. In your packet, you have three attachments uh, that I'll be referencing through the next few minutes. Uh, the first identifies every item in the stiff that we were requesting to, an amendment to today, and there's a, a substantial amount of them. But I wanted to provide the stage for what is the current stiff. It's 2018 through 2021. It was approved by the commission in July of 2017, and we scoped those projects in the mid-2015 timeframe. So I would ask you to pause and think about all the things that have changed since 2015 uh, in this transportation space. In Oregon, we know that we're dealing with our ADA curb ramps very differently now than we were back then. We're focusing our work zone safety improvements our material costs obviously have been increasing due to inflation and a booming economy. And I would also note that House Bill 2017, the largest transportation funding package in our history, was also passed during that time frame. So we scoped all of these projects prior to all those events occurring. I just flag that as a context to why this shift is so important both structurally and procedurally, structurally and culturally in terms of how we move into the 21-24 step. Uh, early next year. So of the 
770 lines in the step still remaining to be delivered, or 771. Uh, we're uh, seeking approval to amend 342 of those. Some of those are fairly benign administrative changes that, quite frankly, you would have never seen. But 154 of those amendments are items that would have been requiring your attention and require your approval today. So instead of bringing you those in five to 10 a month over the next two and a half years, we're trying to capture that today in one swift motion. Well, and I, I don't want the commission to take it personally that they don't want to come before the commission <laughs> with five or 10 of those a month, that I'm sure that it is not us. We'd like to create other opportunities to be in front of you. We would love to have other opportunities for engagement as well. Right. So, uh, there's also a number of these projects that are funding buckets or the way that we do business, but I wanted to specifically mention that 149 of these are what I would consider construction projects, projects we are working to deliver. Uh, I'm gonna switch slides here in a second to speak uh, a little more in depth around the projects that we were outright canceling, give you a little more context behind those. What projects we s truly are slipping out in the delivery schedule, mainly for cash flow purposes. And lastly, speak to a couple specific items around funding that we're looking to advance. So, are the projects truly canceling? 36 projects. Um, for a variety of reasons, as we built the STIP in 2015, even some of these projects may have been lingering around longer than that. Certainly some conditions on the ground have changed. Local support with our community partners may have changed both financially as well as political capital for the improvement. Uh, in some cases, we were able to accomplish the work through other more efficient means. Maybe maintenance was out there or we were able to leverage it with other work planned. So uh, we're gonna move to cancel those projects. Eight, uh, quite frankly, we just don't have the capital uh, to move those along today. So we'll put them back in the queue, uh, but it's gonna be a while. Uh, in that 24, 27 time frame. And then four, we're going to move to what we call design ready or shelf projects. So we're still working to get the design and development process in place for those projects and hold them uh, considering when construction funding may be identified. We often use that tool as uh, federal funds come in higher than anticipated as we adjust our portfolio or potentially as we look to redistribution each summer. So as a business tool, keeping those in the pipeline, if you will. On the right, um, through a little bit of our mechanics of the STIP, we've often struggled with how do you deal with the last year in the STIP, 2021, and the first year of the next STIP, 2021. And our system really al didn't allow us the ability to combine old money and new money. Through some technology and software we've implemented in the department the last few years, we now have that ability. So we're gonna break down that kind of procedural, structural issue that we have with how we manage this STIP and be more transparent, not only to our contracting community, consultant community, but to also to our regional partners about what work we're planning to accomplish in 2021. So part of that's a, a mechanical process, that in my opinion, is a, a much better way for us to be transparent about what work we're planning. We are slipping a substantial amount of work out into that next step, and that's gonna impact how many projects we're gonna be able to fund, how many new projects we're gonna be able to select. One note I will make is we've already been working with our area commissions on transportation to develop those project lists, uh, and now we'll be uh, coordinating with them again on changes uh, reflecting the needs and the funding commitments to deliver what we consider higher priority projects. A lot of that work's already been accomplished or been coordinated through our regional partners, but uh, more work to be done there as we land the 21-24 step. And then lastly, I just wanna mention, um, we've certainly talked at this table about our needs to meet our ADA curb ramp settlement agreement. And we had not uh, at this point identified a substantial, money to, substantial amount of money to meet that need. We're taking our first steps with that $40.8 million item there to uh, aggressively start delivering curb ramp only projects across the state to meet the demands of that settlement agreement. Uh, this is not the only time we'll be in front of you with that request, but as we drive down the cost to do that work, we'll have a better idea about what it's gonna take to continue to meet that commitment. The second item, uh, Oregon 217 Northbound Auxiliary Lane project, that's a House Bill 2017 project that we're asking to advance from 2023 to 2021. 
So we can leverage it with the work occurring on the southbound side as well. And lastly, um, there are a handful of safety and pavement preservation projects that quite frankly are in a, a higher priority need than some that we've already programmed, so advancing those. So uh, in the pavement example, as we've experienced changes in the conditions of the system over the last four plus years, uh, we needed to make some adjustments. So truly capturing uh, how are we making the adjustments to the STIP. One point I'd make, and I'd use a graphic, there's no new money in this conversation. So the pie is only so big. So we're having to reprioritize within that pie. Uh, that means we've had to shift some things out uh, for really cash flow purposes. But we've also looked uh, amongst ourselves and evaluated each of these projects, much to Chris's comment about how much hard work's gone into this, to confirm as best as possible the scope schedule budget of these projects. So that was a lot on the STIP rebalance effort. I want to switch now to House Bill 2017. As we looked at all of those projects, uh, we wanted to pay particular attention uh, to the House Bill 2017 named projects or dedicated projects. Uh, in particular, some of those projects were identified for local funding, and we've been writing uh, intergovernmental agreements and making those funds available as those local communities deliver those projects. That's largely moving smoothly. Uh, but there's a lot of projects that we owe to our, our delivering. And in your packet is a report that we will uh, set the baseline for our performance and the delivery of those projects, uh, as well as affirm our commitment uh, to fully funding those. So we um, had some moments uh, in the building of House Bill 2017 where some projects were quite honestly fleshed out and we had pretty good confidence about what the costs were going to be. Uh, but some truly showed up uh, as a name project on the list with a dollar amount. So we needed to go do some work to confirm scope and how we were going to deliver it. So that report in your packet really captures where we're at today and the baseline moving forward. One of note I would mention is Center Street Bridge here in Salem. Uh, $60 million identified in House Bill 2017 to do a seismic retrofit of that project. Uh, we uh, suggested uh, a $60 million number, but through a lot of additional advanced investigation work and, and study by a consultant, we now know that need is uh, closer to $100 million. So we wanted to affirm our commitment to that project publicly, as well as identify that we will move funds to fully fund that project, not today. That project's not slated for construction until 2025, but at a future date as we update a STIP cycle largely from our bridge program to support that seismic need. So I just wanted to call that project out in, uh, in specifics. So lastly, as we uh, wrap this up, wanted to talk about future efforts. So the top graphic is in your packet. I would not expect you to read this on the screen. But as, as we turn the corner to managing our program differently, not at a project by project measurement, but at a programmatic level, looking to categorize what's the reason that we're in we're making a change to a project. Uh, is it something that was avoidable? We missed it. Uh, we own that, and let's capture that. Maybe it was something that was unanticipated, beyond what was reasonably expected for us to anticipate. Market conditions is something we often talk about, but there's a reasonness, uh, a reasonable expectation of how much we should be predicting in our cost estimates versus something dramatic happening in the environment. And then lastly, uh, we are often in front of you in the past with, this is the right thing to do. Um, that is a moment that we should be reserving when it truly is uh, a good business decision. Leveraging a local improvement that was not planned previously, economic development that's occurring, something that truly just was not available to us at the time. I'd be remiss in not mentioning the flap conversation that just had. I think that's a great opportunity there as those processes are not always in sync. That's a great opportunity as we consider a flat funded project with a, with a project that we are funding. How do we make that good business decision? So we are working actively over the next few months to continue to refine these definitions and put that baseline in place. So as we come back to you a year from now, we'll be able to show our measured success in this area. And we're not done. So just to hit the placemat one more time, Still some more work going on this fall, uh, this summer and fall, as we roll out those scheduling tools, progress reporting tools, all those other continuous improvement efforts that uh, Mr. Kim and Ms. Clark spoke to you last month about. 
So with that, that's uh, my remarks. It's a big structural shift. Uh, we've talked about that. It's a culmination of a lot of work by folks in the room and obviously back in our regions to do this stip rebalance, but we present this to you as our moment to, to reset our process and reset the step moving forward. Let me first by start by saying thank you. I think you have done a great job of taking the commission's interest in um, our concerns about the process. We too, um, when we had a number of project amendments coming at us, it, the perception was that we had missed significantly on a number of occasions the mark on either scoping or the right project or didn't consider different variables within that project and truly what we have is a timeline of space and funding and community changes that all culminate into each individual project needing different discussion points and needing us to maybe revisit and that isn't always bad but when you have a series of those and they're continually in front of us, it really brings the question that you've been able to help us answer. What are we missing here? And how do we get a truer reflection of what truly the costs are, what truly that project might be? And there will continue to be changes. Um, communities continue to grow. Um, you know, what's on the shelf right now waiting for funding probably needs to be dusted off and maybe doesn't, isn't the project that should go forward. We need to be okay with letting go of that as well. But I think getting us to a truer reflection of what the actual costs are, what the project should be, continuing to insert into the ADA pieces, those are critical. Um, and that shouldn't be an afterthought, and it isn't an afterthought, but it feels like it when it's coming to us as an addition versus something that was already baked into it. And so this is that painful moment of the rebalance as you've captured it. This is that course correction of this is a little bit different of a way of doing business and it's going to feel different because there are projects that won't go forward right now, they will in the future, and other ones that need to just drop off. And so um, for us to be okay with that, I think is a great space to be in because we are lifting the veil to truly look at what our practices are and how we are putting that into um, action on the ground. So I, that's a long way to get to thank you because I think it's a much better reflection of the realities in which we are operating. Other questions or comments? Commissioner, please. I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> uh, I think you guys have done a tremendous amount of work and I've been through several STIP processes myself. Uh, how much confidence do you have in this recalibration process that the numbers that come to eventually come to the OTC are going to be up to what we expect. Madam Chair, Commissioner Callery, uh, we have a pretty high level of confidence, but I want to put, um, and I appreciate you asking that question because it affords us the opportunity to answer it pretty directly. Many of the things that you saw on the placemat and that you've been looking at on the placemat, by the way, our term is the placemat, it's that, that long uh, dated graphic that we've had in front of you, have yet to be fully employed. And okay. so what we have is we have um, almost a small step forward now to say, we're recalibrating the current step cycle, seeing what works and what doesn't, affording ourselves the opportunity to come back and really say, okay, these three elements really haven't worked as we've started to refine that process going in, into the next step cycle. Uh, but then the rest of them have. That's one. And then the other is, uh, you know, candidly, as we start to look at the next step cycle, that really is our target because we want to know from the starting position just how much we have available for the projects around the state. Um, anecdotally, maybe I'll say that uh, while I put a few caveats out there as it relates to uh, the, the rebalance effort and a few tools that are not quite yet in place, I, I do imagine you will see uh, a few additional amendments coming forth. And as we bring them forward, uh, we intend to kind of describe those to you by way of um, our stoplight methodology up there, red, yellow, green, so that you know exactly why the change is occurring and you know what you can measure us to. I guess the last thing that I would say is um, I've heard from several of them. I'd be lying if I said that I heard from all of them, but I can tell you that I've got a general consensus that uh, most of the region managers really don't want to be back in front of you for just that. <laughs> and, so, right. uh, and so just by um, sheer force of pride, the hope is that we've got a heck of a lot closer than not. Thank you. Mr. 
I just want to thank you because I know I'm probably the least senior person on the OTC, but probably have been very vocal the last few months and have kind of been on my region's back a little bit, sorry Frank, <laughs> on, on some of the projects that we've had to readjust. And so I really appreciate this. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good move. It's a bold move because you are taking ownership of some of the mistakes that have happened and um, I, I look forward to the future of this. So thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, so thank you for the work. I join my colleagues in, in uh, their comments about the effort and uh, the approach and, and appreciate both. Could we go back to the slide that highlights the rebalance? Uh, that one, yes. So my, my questions are around intergovernmental coordination, community coordination, uh, uh, both with respect to the 36 projects that were canceled and so that's looking back and then looking forward uh, as a result of that experience and other inputs, um, do you have a good process in place for how you uh, work with uh, our partners to ensure that these cancellation that we are looking with you know with uh, eyes open about the impacts and uh, and hear the concerns and are coordinating in a way which minimizes uh, unintended consequences and strain between local government actors and others in the local communities and and ourselves because when we uh, look at approving this, I, I, I would like ideally to have confidence that we've gone through a process there that um, has led to a relatively high level of confidence that we we know uh, what we're, uh, how we're impacting and that we, we've, we've ch checked off. Uh, and then, you know, going forward, are there things you would do differently uh, the next time around? Yeah, Chair, Commissioner Van Brock, or Vice Chair Van Brocklin, uh, your points are well taken. In fact, uh, I think the region managers in particular and their staff probably went to uh, the fullest ends of that conversation, uh, knowing this is a significant decision for several of those projects that the local community has been invested in. Um, so many of those conversations, quite frankly, have been in play for several months now, uh, especially the financially constrained projects of the funding needs uh, and the funding ability of some of those local partners is just not there. Uh, so I think largely most of these have been in the works for a while now. Uh, I have confidence knowing those uh, five gentlemen uh, and the conversations they've been having that we've made those touch points as well as informing our area commissions on transportation throughout this process as well, albeit a quick process uh, informing them. To the point of would we change, absolutely. I think as we develop projects in partnership with local communities, we've put them through the same perils we've put you through. In terms of here's what we believe the scope, schedule, and budget of a project is five years ago, and now we're at construction and we need a check from you. And that's not a position we like putting you in, nor a local community in. And we have those examples in our past. So as we move to uh, whatever the next step cycle looks like, and we look to what opportunities do we have to partner with local communities, how do we ensure that we're implementing the tools that Mr. Strickler and others have mentioned uh, for their projects as well. So we had a moment in time where we missed the mark, if you will, in terms of selecting those projects and getting true cost estimates before we funded them. And I might add also that uh, just a few notes as it relates to the coordination with our partners uh, in some ways, and the irony in this is that the outcome likely would have been the same. It just would have happened over the next year and a half, right? And so it would have felt as though there's more comfort behind a project that maybe just won't materialize in this step cycle and it goes into the next one. So that's the first I'd say. The other is, is I think we're seeing some comfort that we're intentionally talking about our priorities up front in an open way as we're doing this. And not that we haven't been in the past, uh, but specific to what you see on the screen, the ADA and curb ramp work. Uh, we're intentionally talking about a level of investment there that we think is important and is a priority, not just due to the, the litigation element uh, associated with it, but because it's the right thing to do and it's the right thing for us to prioritize. 
Uh, and then the last thing is, is because the size of the pie doesn't change effectively, uh, we have to have those conversations. And so it's forcing us to have a dialogue around priorities in a way that is really more matter of fact than it is positional. And, and that's, I, I think, bearing some fruit <coughs> in this process. Thank you. I, th I think if there's a one of the major themes of the day uh, so far has been uh, intensification of intergovernmental mm -hmm. communication, communication with third parties, understanding the environment, uh, both at various levels of government and within the state government, various departments. And I, I think going forward, we're just going to need to do uh, more and more of that uh, and work in a more integrated fashion. So I appreciate the efforts in that respect. And then encourage uh, them to continue and and that we learn from that and enhance it effectively over time. I just had one quick one for um, Chris and Mac. On that 40.8 for the ADA, what percentage of that falls into regions three through five, would in you the, say? Into regions three through five, is yeah. that a question? Uh... Would you know? It's not a... I prudent question right now. I'm just curious if you didn't off the top of your head. I was just curious how that breaks out. If you'd give me one second. Now it's the point where I dance, I guess, for a little yes. bit. Yes. Uh, so he's he's working through. He does have the information. I've seen it myself. So and, really, and furthermore, okay. how how much further are we still behind with that 40.8 from all the needs that really need to be addressed, given our our lack of investment in ADA. Yeah, Madam Chair, Commissioner Simpson, uh, I can answer that one pretty directly. This is a down payment on a much bigger um, issue as we start to go forward. And this is um, a recognition that, frankly, we got out of the gate kind of slowly, and we need to fix that. Um, part of this, it's, it's funny, I heard the term earlier today, admiring the problem. It's a term that I, I heard from somebody quite some time ago uh, earlier on in my career. And I try and remind myself to say that every once in a while, uh, because if we get caught in that, then you don't get that sense of urgency as you start to dive into a problem such as this. Um, so this is really probably our first kind of strong effort towards funding the thing that we've put a lot of effort into as it relates to priority before. Yeah, so uh, Chair Bainey, Commissioner Simpson, uh, thank you for indulging me a few minutes there. Um, so we're actually, uh, with that $40.8 million, investing uh, funds for ADA curb ramps in all five regions. Uh, the largest investment uh, would be in Region 5. Um, and then substantial investments in Region 1, in Region 3, and Region 4. Region 2 is the, the smaller of the dollar amounts at $3.5 million. So spreading it across all five regions, part of that is by strategy. Um, so how do we spread the work in a way that we're building um, support and strength with our contracting community as we not only work with them to train up on the exact tolerances of building in this environment, but find better ways to do it uh, faster, more efficient, and cheaper. Uh, so that's by one piece. The second uh, is just for our capacity as well. So how do we look to mobilize our workforce across the entire state and show commitment in all communities, not one area in particular? So we have a four-corner document that we need to. <laughs> uh, it gives us a I good would, glide path. It does, yes. So that we can clear the airspace on this. Whoa. Uh, so I am open <laughs> to a motion. <laughs> Did you want to see our list? So you can no. add to it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just I wondering. It, Not yet. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So we um, are being asked to approve this, uh, the rebalance essentially, if you will, and I would welcome a motion. I move for amendment of the 2018 2021 STIP with the recommended changes as a result of the 2019 calibration effort, uh, including the changes listed in the attachment. Excellent. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Great work. Thank and you. And great work to the teams. It's uh, region managers and all of your folks. Um, <laughs> we want to see you. We don't want to have to drag you through a knot hole that continues to get smaller and smaller. Uh, but what it did do is it refined our work product. And uh, it was a, a joint effort. So thank you so much from everyone for your commitment. Okay. Uh, next, let's go on to the director search update. 
So to briefly review where we are, uh, as you know, uh, Director Garrett announced his resignation in January of this year, effective on or about June 30, 2019. Uh, in February this year, the commission created a director search committee. Uh, its members were, or are, uh, Director, uh, or pardon me, uh, Chair Bainey, myself, and Brendan Finn. Uh, I was also named, appointed chair of the search committee, and the search committee was authorized by the Transportation Commission to hire a search consultant. In March of this year, um, we did an RFP, uh, had a number of uh, uh, outside consultants uh, submit proposals, and the search committee, with uh, me recusing myself, uh, selected uh, the firm of Corn Ferry uh, and their uh, the person we're working with is Charlie Ingersoll, uh, who is located in their Washington, D.C. office. In April and May, uh, Corn Ferry did a comprehensive outreach to interested uh, transportation partners and others, uh, including a number of people inside ODOT, uh, and uh, solicited their viewpoints on what the attributes of our next uh, director should be. Uh, Corn Ferry took all of that information and prepared a draft job description for the director since it has been quite some time since uh, there has been the appointment of an ODOT director because of Matt's long service in that role. Uh, that job description was uh, then reviewed by the search committee and was uh, approved by the search committee or, or recommended by the search committee uh, to the OTC and the OTC itself approved uh, that job description. Uh, and, and that now moves us to late May uh, and June and Corn Ferry has now uh, posted the job description in a number of uh, post sites and so it's been uh, circulated broadly in the uh, transportation arena nationally, and we are doing a national search on this. Uh, and uh, we're at the point now where Corn Ferry is uh, hearing from applicants and developing a pool of applicants uh, for first the search committee uh, to consider in August, or pardon me, in July. We'll be looking in mid to late July. Uh, at that list and cutting that list uh, of candidates down to a group of finalists. And we will then have additional process in August um, with respect to interviewing uh, both, uh, we, we will interview uh, a group of candidates and then reduce that number to a group of finalists that will then, uh, the search committee will do the, the uh, the preliminary reviews in late July uh, get to a finalist list. That list will then go before the uh, OTC for for interviews, and we will also have additional public process in August related to a review of the finalist. Our hope is to have a finalist select a di new director selected sometime in, in under our current uh, schedule, you know, sometime in mid to late August. Uh, we, of course, then need to negotiate a, um, a contract with the, with the new director and the director is subject to Senate confirmation. That will uh, likely occur in September if we stay on schedule. Uh, so uh, with that process then would uh, hopefully lead to having a new director seated and in place and directing the agency on or about uh, roughly October 1st. So that is the update and uh, more to come. Uh, I have been in close touch with uh, Charlie Ingersoll at Corn Ferry and they are working to develop a good pool and uh, I'll just say we are hearing from people around the country. So um, I look forward to having a strong <laughs> list uh, that we will be working from to get to a group of finalists that uh, that the entire commission will be interviewing uh, and the five of us will ultimately select. One additional important point, uh, the statute says that the commission has the authority to hire the new director in consultation with the governor 
and we are having active consultation with the governor and the governor's staff. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, Brendan Finn, who is the governor's transportation policy advisor, sits on the on the search committee and uh, <coughs> regularly involved in discussions and attends the search committee meetings. So we are we are consulting with the governor and her staff uh, actively and regularly on this. Well, one, one quick comment, um, Vice Chair Van Brocklin. I, I believe um, uh, based on what I've heard that the, the, the group that is conducting um, the outreach uh, for the for the position has definitely um, been heavily engaged and uh, and as, as Matt would mention, boots on the ground doing outreach to a level that they've never actually have done before, if I'm correct. Um, and I was hoping you could elaborate on that, this extensive outreach process that they've undergone. Thank you for the, the question. It's a good prompt. Uh, I would just say that Corn Ferry, I, I've been very specific with Corn Ferry about the need in Oregon for broad and active and one might say exhaustive process. And um, they have said to me, uh, given the, the in fact, they've been in Oregon three times already uh, and uh, will be back several more times Then this is the uh, most active and extensive outreach they've ever done on a search. Uh, so we are, I think we are going over 100 people now who have been individually uh, interviewed or in, in small group meetings of two or three or four. So uh, it's a... Um, I mean, it's, it's, we're definitely trying to do this um, in a way that uh, resonates with it, with all of those that have an interest in this, and and trying to cover the field effectively, and and really encouraging people to comment and be engaged and be involved. And I I think we're we're doing that, and and Charlie seems to think we're we're really doing that at a high level. So I I feel very good about that. Uh, I'm not saying we've talked to every person that we should talk to or talk to them as often as we should be talking to them, but I feel like we, we are, we're doing a lot here. Um, and, and in comparison maybe to what's gone on in the past, I hope that at the end of the process people feel like they've had more of a window into what we're doing as we go along. I should also mention that we, uh, we have sought public comment uh, in addition to, to doing this outreach, we, we posted and sought public comment on the job description, uh, including on ODOT's site. So we have, um, and we, we've also had a communication process where we're, uh, I specifically am uh, working with Cooper Brown and, uh, and the department have been uh, trying to communicate regularly in writing to people about uh, status. So uh, if we're failing in some way, it's not, for lack of interest or effort, it's um, I feel I feel myself good about what we're doing, and um, and again the proof ultimately will be the how strong the pool is, and we're we're relying candidly very heavily on Corn Ferry because this is what they do. That's why we hired them, and they have a national network that is I would say second to none. So as you can imagine, looking for someone who can carry the legacy forward that Director Garrett has put um, in place, uh, finding someone who can, in fact, walk on water. If you know of someone, Wait, um, please. Right <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> so um, I, another question that I want to briefly touch on, um, and for reasons that are probably obvious, there are a number of nuances in terms of appointing a deputy at this point. Um, the structure of the OTC is um, a number of iterations in um, a statute that has come about over decades, and so um, we, in fact, cannot do that until July 1st, and so we will be announcing what that looks like. We do have a plan, um, but we are going to be um, discussing that at a later date. So um, I think we've, have we touched all corners? I think we have, except one. It's not one, a document, uh, but one, I'm gonna give it a map. Oh, is it, uh -huh. a, is it, it a, a double? Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, it's four corners, so it's twice. It's twice, another one. okay, yeah. another, okay. okay. So, um, <laughs> One other thing I'd, I would just say to everyone here and everyone listening uh, or watching is uh, if you know of people that are interested in this position in or outside of Oregon uh, that have made their interest, uh, made you aware of their interest, I would encourage you to encourage them to, if they're really interested in 
being our next director to come forward and apply. Uh, so we're trying to network, and this is you're all part of our network. So um, there's not a deadline for applying, but I would say there we would ideally like to see people applying in the next two or three weeks. So uh, if you know of people that are thinking about it, tell them to um, make a decision. And if it's a decision to go forward, to get their materials to Charlie Ingersoll at Corn Ferry. Okay. So without further ado, we will go forward with the consent agenda. Director Garrett. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think just on that topic, I hope one of the attributes of the next director is they have a quirky way to communicate. <laughs> Thank you. It may help the cause. Yes. Well, thank you, big guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, um, I want to engage the, uh, the consent calendar, and we're going to do it in three separate actions, given the fact that uh, Vice Chair Van Brocklin must recuse himself. So with that set up on one of the files in consent calendar item number three. So with that, what I'd like to do is pull forward consent calendar number three, that is the resolution to acquire property. And from that, I would like to pull forward file number 9472-001, specific to the port of Coos Bay. It's my understanding Vice Chair Van Brocklin, uh, his law firm represents the port of Coos Bay and he must recuse himself. Is that correct, sir? Yes, thank you, uh, Director Garrett. As you've said, my law firm does legal work for uh, the International Port of Coos Bay, and in an abundance of caution, I'm going to declare a potential conflict of interest and recuse myself from this uh, file. Thank you, sir. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, what I'd like to do now is request approval of consent calendar item number three, specifically file number 9472-001, the Port of Coos Bay. I welcome a motion. So moved. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you for that, Madam Chair. And now I would like to return to consent calendar uh, item number three, the resolution to acquire property uh, and seek approval for the remaining files. So moved. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Madam Chair, finally, uh, receiving no concerns or potential conflicts for the remaining items on the consent calendar, items number one, number two, and number four through 11, I would ask approval in block. So moved. Okay, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, that was a real boots and suspenders <laughs> approach. <laughs> That's belt. belt. Oh, belt. belt. Oh, belt. Oh, his boots on the ground. <laughs> Dang it. I, I'm going to get this right. Okay. Belt and suspenders. I'll get that boots, I have on, boots the on the ground. Yeah, boots I on got the ground. That one. You okay, I'm checking it off. I didn't check it. All right. Okay. Levity is important. And next, we have an important discussion that we have been working on for a number of months, and that is the Connect Oregon dedicated intermodal facilities and opportunities for economic investment in Oregon. So, Mr. Havig, I'm going to turn it over to you and um, thank all the sponsors for being here. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Eric Havig, I'm the planning section manager for ODOT. And uh, I think this is about month five in a row that we've had some conversations on this. So. Hopefully, we're bringing this into a, a decision as we move forward. Real soup to nuts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I don't have those. Uh, um, so we are here to, to bring forward a uh, four-year decision uh, around the uh, intermodal projects out of House Bill 2017. House Bill 2017, as you recall, caught dedicated money potentially for an intermodal project in the Treasure Valley area as well as an intermodal project in the Midwamet Valley. Um, through the, throughout the process, we, we narrowed those uh, proposals down to three. So we have one proposer in the Treasure Valley area and two in the Mid Willamette Valley. And through uh, a number of meetings, primarily starting in February, where we brought a lot of information from project plans, a review from our third party consultant, the Tioga Group, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, the project sponsors. We had some follow-up questions that uh, we wanted to give back to the project sponsors. That was given to them back in March. They have then submitted additional material to uh, Department of Transportation. 
uh, through a couple of submittals. And that is what we're bringing before you today is that additional material uh, that they have responded to, which includes letters from rail, uh, rail operators as well as addressing those questions. <laughs> And then the goal today, we'll be walking through um, the findings from our third party consultant. I'll turn it over to Dan in just a moment uh, on how they viewed all the materials. We'll have opportunities for the project sponsors to come up. After the project sponsors have um, presented their findings and question and answer, if there's a need for, uh, for Dan and myself to come back, if you have follow-up questions for, for Mr. Smith, that's another opportunity. And then we'll get into the decision-making process. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dan Smith with Tugger Group. I'll let him introduce himself and the findings that his firm has made. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chairman. And Mr. We're gonna make sure that your mic is on so we can hear you. Thank you, Jack. There it is. Oh, bingo, thank you. Um, yeah, new brand for me. Um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I am Dan Smith, a principal with the Tioga Group. We were retained to assist ODOT and the Commission, uh, and we greatly appreciate the opportunity to work with you on these grant proposals. We also appreciate the efforts that the three sponsors have made to assemble a lot of information um, in a series of type deadlines and to tackle the questions we've raised. Um, our full review is in the memos we assembled, um, so for this afternoon, I'm just going to hit the highlights here. Uh, we reviewed three proposals. Um, the Muller County um, Development Commission Treasure Valley Reload Center, the Mid Willamette Intermodal Center at Millersburg, and the Oregon Port of uh, Willamette at Brooks. Um, as we said in February, all three proposals appear techni technically feasible. If the projects were built and funded as they were originally envisioned, um, they would provide public benefits and in line with the grant program goals. But it's also still true that none of these projects really control their own destiny. Um, their success depends on their ability to produce an acceptable transportation service at a competitive rate. And that, in turn, depends on their ability to assemble the complex mix of facilities, equipment, uh, railroad services required, and to do it all at a cost under the, uh, uh, what customers are paying today. There was only one proposal for a Treasure Valley project, and it is for a cold storage and transload facility served by the Union Pacific. Um, there's no disagreement on the basic facility and its functions at all. The original intent was to provide an expedited service comparable to Union Pacific's Cold Connect service, which is offered out of Wallula, Washington. Uh, instead, Union Pacific has now offered manifest service at existing tariff rates which are basically the same as what Treasure Valley shippers already have. Um, in addition, um, Union Pacific has also made it clear that TVRC and its customers have to provide their own rail cars. Um, as yet, there is no provision in place for doing that, and the cost is, is unknown at the moment. Since TVRC uh, would be offering the same basic rail rates and services as the shippers in the Treasure Valley can already use, um, there's also a question of how this operation would differ from the existing rail ser served cold storage facilities in the Treasure Valley, of which there are at least three, maybe more. Um, with the information now available, the sponsors should be able to um, refine their business case, uh, put together a well-defined service package with actual rates, actual transit times, actual schedules, and take that uh, value proposition to their potential customers and have them verify that it is indeed valuable and competitive. The context for the two Willamette um, intermodal proposals is unique, and it's a legacy of decisions made by the ocean carriers to offer rail service into Portland instead of making direct vessel calls there. Right now, importers and exporters have two choices. They can truck their containers directly to Seattle or Tacoma, or they can truck their containers to and from Portland and use either the um, NWCS or BNSF rail services to connect with the actual uh, ports in Seattle and Tacoma. We learned in the Oregon Trade and Logistics Study that those services are effectively subsidized by the ocean carriers, um, and that makes them the price leaders. The price that they 
offer in combination with the uh, drayage is usually significantly less than the trucking rate to Seattle and Tacoma. So in one sense, if the importers and exports can use those rail services and meet their scheduled needs, they will use them. They go to the full trucking cost if they must. Um, but both BNSF and Northwest containers serve Seattle and Tacoma in rotation. They don't go to each marine terminal combination every day. So for example, if I need to get my container to Seattle on a day when the train is going to Tacoma, I either have to ship it a day earlier to catch the earlier train, or I have to truck it. So that means that neither rail service really gets the whole market to themselves. The customer relationships are also very complex, and that's caused a good deal of confusion, I think, in the course of putting these project proposals together. The ocean carriers offer a bill of lading uh, at Seattle or Tacoma for delivery of a container to their marine terminal. They also offer a bill of lading at Portland at a higher price, and that higher price represents a share of the rail cost. They do not actually charge the full rail cost because they do subsidize it to some extent. But it's still less than the trucking cost. Now, when importers or exporters deliver or pick up a container at NWCS or BNSF in Portland, they are actually picking up or delivering it to the ocean carrier itself. The ocean carriers buy the rail service from NWS, NWCS, or BNSF and turn around and offer it to the shippers as a way of avoiding the vessel calls at Portland. Now, why does all this matter? This matters partly because so far it appears that the ocean carriers have been reluctant to extend that subsidy south of Portland. Um, partly because I think they already have the business and they don't, they don't see a new business opportunity in going farther south. Um, that means that the Willamette Valley intermodal uh, projects will likely have to be standalone competitors to truck service between the Willamette Valley and Portland. Um, the original idea in both cases was to run through trains between their facilities in the Willamette Valley directly to and from uh, the ports of Seattle and Tacoma. That concept has been replaced by what are now going to be connecting rail services between Millersburg and NWCS at Portland on one hand, or between Brooks and either BNSF or UP in Portland on the other. That means the two services would be replacements for trucking between the Willamette Valley and Portland, not trucking between the Willamette Valley and Seattle and Tacoma. If we imagine an exporter in Eugene, for, for example, he could save about 50 miles each way by turning the truck around at Brooks rather than continuing on to Portland or he could save about 75 miles each way by turning the truck around at Millersburg rather than continuing to Portland. Once the rail services connect at Portland, the costs and services going to Seattle and Tacoma will be the same as at present as far as we can determine. Uh, as I said earlier, NWCS and, North, and uh, BNSF are already the price leaders, so there's not really much opportunity to create new intermodal business. Uh, in essence, we're extending the same intermodal business farther south, and perhaps adding about a day to the transit time. Um, that also does mean that even if the sponsors get all the traffic they are hoping for, the impact on highway congestion will be minimal. Now, the two sponsors are taking on a real challenge because the tough part here is going to be competing with 50 to 70 miles of extra trucking. That's about 60 to 90 minutes additional driving time in each direction. Um, we don't think either service can compete with that on a standalone basis. The distances involved are just too short. Uh, we put up this same chart from the uh, uh, Econ Northwest study in February. It shows that rail costs get much higher than truck costs as you go to shorter length of hauls. And this chart ends at 150 miles, and here we're talking about 50 to 75. Um, if the ocean carriers will not subsidize that service to the Willamette Valley, we don't really see how the cost combination will work. We don't see how either proposed service can compete with trucks over such a short distance, especially if it'll take a day or so longer. Now, to, some, to review some details, um, MVIC at Millersburg would be served by UP with what they're calling manifest service. Manifest service is essentially picking up those cars 
as part of the existing regular freight service going back and forth on that line, uh, as opposed to a dedicated train that was just going to carry the intermodal. And that will connect with the existing Northwest Container Services in Portland. Um, schedules have been discussed, but we've not yet seen uh, documented pro forma schedules. Northwest Container has also been named as the Millersburg Terminal Operator, and there's a draft cost plus contract in place. Uh, we understand the contract is not yet signed because there's still some due diligence to be done. The NWCS connection means that the operation between Portland and the ports of Seattle and Tacoma is already in place. That's a good thing because that's in fact a pretty complex business and I think more complex than the proposers neither, um, either project initially understood. Um, that does mean, however, that again, most of the existing Millersburg business would probably be coming from existing NWCS customers. A Willamette Valley shipper would be able to choose between trucking directly to Puget Sound, um, trucking to Northwest Container at Portland, or trucking to MVIC at Millersburg. That shipper is going to make the choice depending upon um, location, schedule, and cost. If the project sponsors, the MVIC, can offer favorable rates and schedules, it will get a decent sit, uh, piece of the business. If the schedules and rates aren't competitive, it's going to get very little traffic. Uh, the UP rates have not yet been documented, nor is the overall cost of the service or the schedule. Until those gaps are filled, we can't really compare the options to existing dredge or verify competitiveness in the eyes of the shipper. OPW at Brooks would be served by Portland and Western, preferably connecting with BNSF at Portland. Uh, Portland and Western has been very positive about the project and I think very diligent in trying to put together the pieces. Uh, BNSF has been silent, at least in print, um, despite what we do understand to be ongoing negotiations. The preferred route involves somewhere between two and four million dollars of clearance improvements uh, which do not yet have an identified funding source. Um, there is an alternative route. It does involve using trackage, trackage rights over UP and we understand there's some discussion about where the interchange would take place and whose permission is required and what the costs would be. Um, OPW has sought a um, Portland and Western UP option, but as I say, it's not quite clear how that would work. There's still some, some it, if you read the documentation, they don't all line up with each other yet. There's still some back and forth going on. So at this point, we don't yet have a complete rail plan, um, and the lack of, of BNSF concern, um, concurrence is a real stumbling block going forward. If the service were put together as they envision, uh, here again a Willamette Valley shipper would have, be able to choose between trucking to BNSF or Northwest Container at Portland, or trucking to OPW at Brooks and have them make the connection to one or the other. Um, the shipper again is going to choose based on location, service, and cost. To succeed, OPW would have to offer favorable rates and schedules, and in this case its market would be mostly former or current BNSF shippers. Um, Cordial Intermodal Services is a well-qualified uh, marine, uh, marine, rail terminal operating firm. Um, they've contracted to be the Brooks Terminal Operator. They have a draft contract in place, cost plus for the first three years, and then the, a shared risk thereafter. Um, should those rail access issues be resolved, um, a business plan needs to be put together again based on a, a formal schedule, actual rates, uh, and test the value proposition with the potential customers. So both intermodal projects have moved forward. Um, neither yet has a financially viable business plan or has tested their actual value proposition with potential customers. Um, after all the financial and institutional pieces are assembled, the freight transportation business comes down to rates, service, reliability, frequency, the basics. Um, we need schedules and transit times so customers can verify that their needs will be met. Uh, we need to move from estimates to actuals. We all went through a period uh, in these projects where we did studies and we estimated things and we drew graphs and so forth. But at this point, we have to determine what the various participants will provide at what price. Rather than trying to guess their cost, we need to find out what their price will be. And that can be an important difference. We also need to know what the existing alternative is 
uh, what customers are actually paying for the truck alternative. Again, there have been estimates, but the estimates vary widely, and we need to know the actuals. Uh, we also need to have some notion of how low the drainage companies can go to compete, because they can and they will cut their rates to keep their market. So we need some guesses there. We need some informed guesses. So there are still some information gaps to be filled, and I think it's largely because these projects have shifted in the last few months from the original concepts. The models and the pro forma spreadsheets that were put together six or eight months ago are for different operations than are being planned today. Um, rail car supply is a major gap for the Treasure Valley proposal. Um, the sponsors also need to clarify just what services AmeriCold will provide there and how the TVRC offer offerings will differ from the other facilities and services already in the region. Uh, we understand there's still some due diligence issues around the uh, Millersburg uh, development site, and there needs to be some clarity there on the commercial relationships between actual shippers, Northwest Container, um, LEDG, UP, and the ocean carriers, because you read different documents, some of them seem to imply different rem uh, revenue streams than others, so that needs to be resolved. The OPW project needs to resolve those rail issues, um, including concurrence from whatever combination of railroads are eventually going to be used, and a clear understanding of the routes, the interchange, uh, interchange points, the services that will be offered, and the prices. Most critically, um, the sponsors need to establish the basics of the businesses as they're now envisioned. That means determining the full costs and replacing um, estimates with either actuals or very narrow documented ranges, um, documenting the services that are going to be offered in terms of frequencies, schedules, transit times, and connections, uh, providing direct comparisons with competing alternatives, meaning round trip to round trip for the intermodal comparisons, and loading dock to loading dock for the Treasure Valley comparisons. Um, and finally, presenting those costs, services, and comparisons to potential customers and getting them to respond with, yes, this is competitive, yes, this is valuable, yes, this is better than what I'm using now, and yes, I will use it. Um, at Tioga, we've been rail and intermodal advocates for decades. We would like to see these projects succeed if they can. Um, right now, absent those basics, we don't really know if we have viable business propositions. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. I want to say thank you. I really appreciate the continued engagement in helping us to go through this process. Um, so we really are at a crossroads today. And as you've pointed out, there lacks some continued more um, supplemental information that would allow us to feel have better confidence in going forward, if we will, if you will. Um, what is the likelihood of the ability within the next 30 days or so for the project sponsors to be able to um, provide the information that you think would be beneficial for us to uh, make a decision? And maybe that's not a fair question, but I'm going to throw it out anyway. Fair. That's what we're here for. Okay. Uh, I would say there is no technical barrier. There's no reason, hard reason, why that information can't be put together within 30 days. I did notice there, an email came through from UP, said they're provide, willing to provide rates within by middle of the next week or something, I said. It said uh, Treasure Valley, I think, has most of the, almost all the information they need. Treasure Valley just needs to get a couple of um, quotes on rail car. Mm -hmm. Cost that they can build in, but they have they have the rates from UP. Um, they know the schedules because people have shipped before. They know what the competing um, competing offerings are like. So I think they should definitely be able to uh, assemble a very good picture of how their offerings compare with the existing choices in that 30 days. Um, working with the railroads um, has been slow. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say Portland and Western has has sort of been exemplary in trying to get information out there, but <coughs> that information still isn't complete. Uh, there are the issues around <coughs> trackage rights, payments, waivers, interchange points can be very 
um, some of it goes back 100 years, so it can be very tricky. But sure. there's no reason why uh, they can't achieve some kind of resolution within 30 days or at least narrow down the issues to the point where you folks can make an informed decision. Um, the UP letters to both intermodal, um, intermodal proposals, I believe, said that they're willing to provide rates to shippers. So at some point, we just have to define who that shipper is going to be and get that rate from UP. Um, the, the operators at both intermodal uh, proj uh, projects, um, CIS and NWCS, both very you know, well-regarded, experienced operators. I think they know their business very well and would be able to work with the sponsors and fill in their pieces. I, it will be tough to get um, actual drayage rates that are being paid today. People don't like to give that information out. But in a sense, someone needs to set a fire under the shippers and say, look, if you want this service, if it's going to be valuable to us, to you, you need to help us document the business case. Mm -hmm. um, if, if they aren't forthcoming, I don't know, maybe that's a signal that the comparisons aren't as good as we would like. But uh, I, do, I did read in one of the previous studies that was done that um, Econ Northwest did get access to some shipper bills, bills of lading. Were they able to read what had actually been paid for what? And that's the kind of information that we really need to, um, to solidify the business case and let folks make a good decision. Great. Thank you. And I think you raise a great point, and that is um, UP, BNSF, Portland Western, they are in the business to make money. They're not benevolent organizations as much as on occasion we might want them to be. Um, so one would suggest that that engagement um, should be one in which would offer some excitement of being able to have an opportunity to expand their business operations. So, I would certainly hope so. Other questions or comments at this point? And I, I think we have asked that you not go too far. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Havig, um, I'm looking through my. Do you want to? So, I. Uh, Madam Chair, at this point, um, I think it's appropriate that we uh, go in order and bring up the project sponsors and give them their their opportunity to share their information. They've had access to uh, Tioga's reports, uh, recommend or the information that ODOT has put together and various scoring and decision frameworks. Okay. Um, so I'm sure they'll have some some points that they want to share with you. Uh, we propose we'd have the Treasure Valley team come first, followed by Millersburg and then Brooks. Um, I think it would be appropriate also after the, each team does their presentation, if there's follow-up questions that you need to ask, uh, that would be a great time to do that. And then upon the completion of all three uh, project proposers in the Q&A, if there's a need for uh, Dan and myself to come back and follow up questions and any clarity of things we heard, uh, happy to do that. Wonderful. And I, while we're doing that, I, I want to put a couple things on the record. And I, um, it, a number of comments have been made about the process. And some would suggest that maybe the process has taken too long, and some might suggest that the process is not taking long enough. Um, the commission, although the projects and the funding is identified in a House bill, it does not mean that those funds should not be scrutinized and be given the same rigor as we would um, expect any other business decision that we might make. Um, I just want to be really clear that the commission understands that we are spending public dollars and there is a level of scrutiny in that spend that, um, you know, I would submit as, as chair, I'm slightly frustrated that we are at a point of needing a bit more in terms of business plans and performas and being able to connect all of that. Um, at the end of the day, we need to make a decision, and it will be based on the performa. It will be based on not that it was earmarked in a bill. It will be based on the fact that it's going to be good for Oregon and benefit Oregon's economy. And so um, as you come up to give us your comments, I do hope that you will be addressing the comments that have been uh, given by Tioga and the outstanding questions that we have. We are really at a go, no go sort of point, and we need to have clarity so that we can go forward. And I, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues want to add anything, but I um, felt like we needed to be clear about approach. Okay. All right, go right ahead, please. I would just second those comments, Chair. Um, as somebody who has to 
actually utilize a lot of um, uh, debt financing uh, for my own business ventures. Um, it's 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 goes through significant scrutiny, and any I that's not dotted or T that's not crossed, um, as you can imagine, um, it's not it's not welcome too too friendly and too open, you know. And so, um, uh, and that's just from the private sector, private capital. So from the from the public side, um, I just want folks to understand that it it should it should come with that same of level of scrutiny and oversight of whether or not if things are actually teed up to the to the degree that would actually um, receive uh, full support uh, in the interest of spending public resources. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You. So Treasure Valley. <laughs> Good afternoon, and you do need to be a little aggressive on the button. Um, okay, or Jackie will help out. So, oh, good, it's Thank on. You. All right, Commissioner, please. And so we have allocated uh, ten minutes for a presentation, five minutes for questions, and I will turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair Bainey. Um, for the record, my name is Greg Smith, and I'm the Economic Development Director for Malheur County Economic Development. If I might just use uh, ninety seconds of my time to let allow uh, County Commissioner um, Larry Wilson share a few thoughts and then I'll jump into the details. Wonderful. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you for uh, allowing us to talk to you today. I'm going to shorten up what I had to say to allow Greg more time. Uh, but a few things. Uh, we appreciate the fact that the scrutiny and, and, and the work we're having, the steps we're having to go through to assure that this is going to work. Uh, there's not a county in this state that needs help more than Malheur County. Um, so it's our chance to hit a home run and we're trying to hit a grand slam instead of just a home run. Uh, there's tremendous support and enthusiasm, not just in, in, in uh, Malheur County, but across the river as well. Uh, huge ag area. There's just developing a lot more into, uh, uh, well, with population growth. So. I think they're looking towards us as they want to utilize our center. Um, Idaho is very aggressive. I think time's of the essence. If we can provide you with a good plan, we need to get moving sooner than later, just because they, they, if they wanted to step in, they, they do things faster than we do. Uh, but we uh, also like to retain the businesses we have as well as attract new ones, which I believe this will. Um, a lot of it, until we can move forward and they see a definite plan and, and we're, we're moving forward, I believe that's when the interest will really peak and we'll know, we'll, I think it'll be successful. I know it will. Um, for an example, we've had five businesses just out of the Nissa community, all ag businesses, moved right across the river and within a mile and a half, there's over $35 million worth of uh, buildings on Idaho tax rolls, not Oregon anymore. And we're struggling to keep another business out of Nissa, another eight, ten million dollar project going over there just because they are getting tired of waiting. And so if we can, um, if we can meet your uh, regulations and, and stipulations and stuff with and, and get your confidence in that. We'll do everything possible. Now your county court has all the confidence in the world in Greg and and uh, and and we appreciate working with you folks. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, again, my name is Greg Smith. We've had a chance over the last uh, 60 days to go back through and to review the prior assessments and recommendations that have been made by the ODOT staff by your Freight Advisory Committee, your Citizen Final Review Committee, Director Garrett, and the Tioga Group. And we have to share with you, we think they're extraordinarily reasonable, uh, we think they're prudent, uh, and we don't have any disagreement on any of those. We do um, think there's some context that we should provide and perhaps some additional clarification. And I'm gonna be utilizing the chart that was provided. I believe you folks have a copy of that. Uh, and I'll make this very, very quick. 
Um, I want to clarify on the farmer property. It appears ready to be acquired, and we only get a little half moon there. Um, that price is set. It's in escrow. What we have strategically done, though, is we've acquired th three escrow agreements, well, two with a, sec a third one potential, and then we've had communications as well with other landowners. Now, why would I do that? <clears throat> because when you don't have options, the price of real estate goes up. And so what I have to do is make sure that we have access to one mile stretch in order to get a unit train off. And uh, I need to make sure I get it at the best possible price. Uh, but that price is set. We know what it is and uh, we think it's reasonable. I want to share with you the second little half moon that we would hope you'd fill into a full moon is it talks about that this is existing agricultural property. That is not correct. Uh, Director Rue has signed a letter that has uh, helped us with the commissioner's leadership, convert that to industrial for outright use. The land is ready to be utilized. Uh, on the, on the uh, consensus uh, as it relates to the net revenue anticipated, what I'd share with you is I've probably failed on this in making the model clear. What we anticipate doing is following a Port of Moro model where the port builds infrastructure they find the very best tenant to operate and they lease in a triple net lease with a percentage of profit back um, arrangement. This is done all the time. Tidewater has an agreement with the Port of Morrow. Barenbrug has had a good agreement with the Port of Morrow. Northwest Container Service, who you'll hear about later, has had this similar agreement. And Watts <coughs> Brothers Frozen Foods, Con Agra today, has had similar agreements. <coughs> I'm very familiar with them. They're a tremendous way for a public entity to establish the asset, but not get caught in the minutia of having to operate it. We leave that to the professionals. So I would hope uh, that blank circle might at least get a half moon. Um, diversified freight, can't deny it. Malheur County is about onions. And what we're looking at doing, and I hope I can correct another misperception, we're trying to build additional capacity Yes, we would love to have uh, uh, the express train, and someday perhaps we may be able to get there, but we're starting small. And why $26 million is a lot of money in the scope of industrial development, this is a start, gang. This is a start. And what we're hoping to do is to begin to have that capacity. Um, development. A little half moon again, development would take agricultural land out of inventory. That should be a full moon. Again, the land zoned industrial for outright use, of which I would put on the record, thousand friends of Oregon came and testified in support of that. And the reason they did that is they recognize when you support facilities of this nature, it protects other agricultural properties. And so uh, we had hoped you'd give us a full moon there. Um, this is where context comes in. Impacts on local sense of place. We got a half moon. Come spend a day with me in Malheur County. This facility is going to be welcomed. It's going to fit right in with Ontario, with Nyssa, with Vail, and with all the folks who live there. And we'd ask you to uh, take that little half moon and, and change it. Now, the final one is risk of future non-service. Everything the Tioga Group raised is fair. It's accurate. There's no doubt about it. But I'd share this with you. That's the same thing whether you're at the Port of Moro or the Port of Portland. Port of Portland has to deal with the same issues as it relates to BNSF. Okay? And so there's uncertainty. Madam Chair, you raised the issue correctly. Uh, they're not a benevolent organization. It's about profit. And so that's what we, recognizing that what we've tried to do is build the strongest coalition we can. We've put the best team together that we can. And that includes Union Pacific executives who have been out to the site multiple times and are working with us. Executives from Texas, Omaha, and Salt Lake City, and Sacramento have been out there, and they're working with us. And they gave us the letter that was requested of us at the prior meeting. Here's the challenge on rates. You're exactly correct. We need those. But if you'll remember, go back and look at your public record. UP said we have a 10-step process. Okay? We're now at step number five where we did the commercial viability. They gave us the letter. They said we reviewed it. You're on the mark. Go. But if you look at step number six, you have to pay for 30% design engineering. I can't get to the final rates until we move further down the UP process. And so I agree so much with what's being said, but Union Pacific is dictating that. Second, we've uh, been in 
communication with Americal, the largest uh, uh, storage producer, and I'm sorry I'm in a rush, so I'm going a little quick here, in the United States. We have sat down and had communications with them to where we can contract with them as paid consultants to assist us in the design and operation of this facility, making sure the doors are the right height, making sure they're the right width, making sure that we have the tracks developed correctly. And so we're excited about that. We've reached out to Cryotrans for rail car availability. We genuinely apologize. We thought we submitted that. Um, unfortunately, and I'll put it on myself, perhaps it didn't get submitted, but we have it right here that talks about rail car availability and their willingness to work with us. Finally, I want to talk economics. I've got 41 seconds. We reached out to our primary onion folks and said, listen, we got to be able to tell the commission that this thing is going to work for you. And so we put together a letter that we asked our larger shippers without breaching confidentiality, without handing over their shipping destinations, without handing over their current pricing mechanisms, will this work for you based on what is being shared, based upon the economics we're showing you? And they came back and said yes. Madam Chair, we live in a competitive world. I would love to be able to just lay numbers down. Unfortunately, those become public records and it creates a challenge for me. We're ready to go. We're ready to work. We need your approval and we ask for it. Okay, Commissioner Keller. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, you know, I've looked at, at the outline of this, this whole area, Nessa, Ontario, Vail, and I've seen a lot on the maps uh, of existing facilities. And my question is, have you looked at the capacity that already exists for the shipment of this type of a commodity without this level of investment I mean, if it can be done with the existing capacity, then we're all a winner. And I'm, I'm concerned about that. Yeah, so Madam Chair and Commissioner, what I would share with you is I wish I had Google Earth here right now. What I would share with you are those existing facilities are privately owned. And yet we have shippers and growers who are just as important to the county court and to the citizens of Malheur County that are not located on the UP mainline who are having to ship their commodities, as we've heard, to Washington or to Salt Lake City or to locations in Idaho. What this facility is going to do is provide a public resource managed by the private sector, but a public resource that all of our shippers and growers can utilize. Are all of these private facilities not accepting shipments from any other growers? No, most definitely. That's an arrangement, but we have to be really clear. They're also moving their own commodities, mm -hmm. and so those become priority number one. And then what ends up happening is basic economics kick in and the price goes up. And so what we're trying to do with this infrastructure is provide additional capacity and a level playing field so those who aren't on the UP mainline can utilize the service in the county and not have to take their products out of state. Thank you. So how do you do that with that ongoing subsidy? Again, our goal on this, Madam Chair, is a model very similar to the Port of Moro. What okay. we're going to do, well, let me, let's just step back on this. Let's be really blunt. There's no debt on this project. And without having that interest expense clicking, what we intend to do is enter into a triple net lease uh, with a percentage of profit and let uh, a private entity operate this facility. And again, with a little bit of due diligence, I can show you multiple models where that's been accomplished. And so in the end, it'll be uh, on the company we negotiate with sure. to operate the facility at a profit to them, at a profit um, that can be passed on for future transportation investments. Okay. But uh, in the end, um, they're gonna pay the light bill. Commissioners, any questions? I would add, uh, oh, I'm Please. sorry. Whoops, sorry, a little slippery up here. Um, so a, a couple of 
couple of questions. Uh, one is around um, return on investment. Mm -hmm. So I think what I read was that the project plan was was an ROI of one to one, but I didn't note in there um, anything about rail car costs. So I wonder, since we we are obviously focused on on the question, not just with respect to your proposal, but all proposals about what is, do we have a positive return on investment over time and and over what period of time? And so the, I think I'm correct that the ROI of one-to-one -one was predicated on not including real car costs and those obviously would, would change that presumably. So could you talk me through the ROI uh, <laughs> of this project. Yeah. First of all, I want to refer to uh, Commissioner Wilson's comments and recognize that um, uh, the in, the uh, reload development that we're discussing is in an area of high poverty um, and limited economic opportunity. So I want to be very clear for those who are thinking return on investment as it relates to real estate growth, et cetera. Um, what I would share with you is we retained Eco Northwest. We asked them to take a look at this project and to run that scenario for us. They, when it was all said and done, really came back with a couple thoughts. One was this is going to provide an opportunity for Malheur County growers and shippers to not be crossing over the Blue Mountains to get to Walla Walla, to, to the Wallulas, Pasco area, um, thereby creating less depreciation on the road, less carbon in the air, and greater efficiency for folks uh, at home. That was number one. Number two, um, again, our goal on this facility is to not have debt. And so that return on investment, if we can maintain that relationship to where we may have someone else carry that liability, um, while that return on investment may be uh, uh, a long-term, increase, um, we think we're going to be able to keep it from declining. The goal on this is to have no debt. And so uh, really the return to the state of Oregon is one is uh, reduced truck traffic between uh, uh, Nyssa and Washington and parts of Idaho and Utah. And I would share with you, I, I, I would have you bring your Region 5 ODOT manager up and ask re relieving truck traffic between Ontario and Baker City, um, is that important? And I think you'd find the answer is yes on that. And then again, reduce carbon and uh, reduce wear and tear on those uh, highways. My dad to Greg's comments, uh, uh, I understand they were telling us that each car is uh, equivalent of four and a half semi truck loads. There's a critical shortage and it's getting worse in truck drive, you know, uh, I think they said there's a shortage of what around 40, 50,000 truck drivers right now. Uh, the young guys don't want to work, uh, can't pass pass the P test and stuff. But that's a lot of trucks off the road, and and I can't remember the what UP told us, but it was a significant fuel savings um, mm -hmm. across in the nation and and every uh, state from here to New York or. Chicago was happy to get those trucks off the road. We, we heard nothing but positive that way. So we feel like that's going to really assist us in, in growing maybe quicker. Uh, that's, that's what I hear from all the growers, and I know a whole lot of them that are, are they're very anxious to use this. So they're having trouble getting trucks and getting their product out. So my other question is, um, for facilities similar to the one that, that uh, your group is proposing, uh, I, uh, my question, uh, other question was about whether you know of any examples in which facilities like the one you're proposing were so heavily reliant on a single agricultural resource and commodity, in this case, onions. Mm -hmm. um, are there other, are there other facilities that you're aware of and have looked at that were primarily or predominantly dependent on a single commodity? Um, yeah, very much so, uh, uh, Madam Chair and, and uh, Vice Chair. Um, without getting too much into my personal background, uh, I was trained at the Port of Morrow 
and uh, I had the blessing of working on a cold storage development project uh, in which I had an opportunity um, to understand that pen pennies matter and seconds count and uh, had a chance to work under Gary Neal on the development of that project. Now with that said, um, we also, um, I'll just say that the Port of Moral wants to see this succeed and Ryan Neal, the new general manager who was the manager of their cold and dry storage facilities has offered any and all assistance. And uh, Gary Neal, uh, um, I'm gonna speak for him here. He's agreed to come out and assist on this project and provide any consultation that we may need. And so, um, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, what we're trying to do is put the very best team together so those who have those expertises can assist us. And, and really that's what my job is, is to get the team together and then rely on, on uh, who can offer so is the Port of Moro facility dependent primarily on a single? Yeah, excellent question. It, it really is. It's uh, it's very onion, or excuse me, a potato dependent. Potato dependent. Okay. And then I'd share with you on the Tidewater uh, container um, movements at their marine terminal, um, it's heavy on um, um, waste material. And so there are examples where okay. one commodity um, can succeed, but then what it does is it comes down to volume. And so part of what we have to be able to do is control those fixed costs, right. keep no debt. You cannot have debt. As soon as a project brings debt to their facility um, in the initial startup, it's, it's the kiss of death. And so our objective in all this is to build to what we can afford. And then to be really candid with you, the, uh, the county commission has directed me to go after um, a build grant to try and leverage the do these dollars into additional. And so, uh, but with no debt. That's our goal. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Please. Yeah, I want to know how you get into the business of having no debt. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to know. Um, but um, the, related to that, you, you had indicated um, um, a little bit earlier about a 10 step process. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. And, um, Yes, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner, I, I wish I would have brought a, a sample of that slide. During the last commission meeting that we were allowed to present at, Union Pacific um, made a presentation as well. And they provided a chart that really was a flow chart that said here's step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, we had completed step four, which was preliminary engineering, will the site work, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But as you'll recall, we got called out that we hadn't completed step five, which says, have you done a customer analysis? Have you done a basic market survey that will meet UP's needs? And so, as you'll recall, we were sent back to the drawing board. We were uh, asked to work with Union Pacific. And so uh, what we did is we went around to our growers, our shippers, mm -hmm. and we presented to them what Union Pacific was asking, and they provided us the survey. Mm -hmm. They gave us the survey and said, have each of your customers asked this. We did it, we consolidated it, sent it to them. They sent it to Omaha. They did their analysis. They came back with the letter you have today that says, um, we will stop and provide you service. Yes, it is manifest service, but we're expanding capacity, and this is our first step. And then step number six is um, move to 30% design engineering, and that's really critical because the Union Pacific wants to make sure is the topography correct? Is you know what you said in soil samples is that accurate, et cetera? And so they want a little digger deep, deeper dive on um, digger deep on. Uh, on that and so we're ready to go there the challenge is it takes money and so we're ready to move to the next step with Union Pacific the challenge I would have or, or, or what I would share with you is Union Pacific's not ready to talk rates and schedule till step nine and we're at step six and so that's the disconnect there and so I can't lay out certain pieces of the question that are very legitimate, very legitimate, I don't argue, because they're public records. And these folks are not gonna lay their public records down in the uh, environment in which we work. Commissioner, go ahead. I hope that answers your question, Commissioner. If 
you believe that this is that viable project, and your I understand your your goal of not having any debt. Uh, would you be willing to take on the debt of the 30% design to move forward? Yeah, I, I, um, Madam Please. Chair, uh, Mr. Commissioner, I, I can't speak for my board. I can't speak for my county commissioners. Uh, I think we would be uneasy with that. What we would recommend if that's, uh, if there's still that level of concern is that uh, we get an approval with a stage gate process which is very similar to other projects uh, uh, that I work with. And we just continue to work with uh, your staff through steps, which is very reasonable on a project of $26 million. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Representative Finley, wonderful to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Chair Bainey. May we begin? Yes, okay. please. Uh, thank you, Chair Bainey. If it would be all right, I'd like to take 90 seconds or 120 seconds and turn it over uh, to Commissioner Nyquist to uh, introduce us. Wonderful. Great to see you. Uh, you're turning it over to me? Please. Are you thinking I'm only going to take 120 seconds? Good luck with that. <laughs> Am I on? Yes. Testing? Yes. Uh, first, I, Director Garrett, I, I want to thank you for your service uh, to the people of Oregon and, and the people of Lynn County, uh, your leadership. Um, the education of Roger and transportation things has been um, awkward at times, and, and thanks for letting me stay in the room. So, so um, I, I want to start by saying that uh, we sent you a, an executive summary of for our business plan last week. Uh, we began working on that in earnest at the end of the April commission meeting, uh, commissioner, with, with, with your request for a detailed business plan. We have that detailed business plan today that, 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 that I could put on the table, we could discuss and scrutinize. Uh, the problem is, is much of that information in that detailed business plan is proprietary. And to get people in the, in the industry to share with us so we could come up with that deal, detailed business plan, we had to pledge confidentiality. So we're gonna need to, to be able to work through that. Um, I think for our project, it speaks volumes that, that the preeminent company and person in this business in, in the region, uh, Gary Cardwell, has signed up to be part of this project. Um, it's one thing to do studies and analysis. It's another thing for real people doing real work, shipping things really in a timely manner, and, and Gary is the guy that's doing that. Part of the executive summary you got was his analysis and his, his numbers. I, I would submit to you that, that nothing comes more accurately than that, the stuff actually happening on the ground today. One of the things that's not been included in this conversation, if you will, that, that, that has to happen as, as part of this is a value added is the reduction of empty container trips. And our Millersburg facility um, will allow for that, the interchange of those uh, containers. We've been, the conversation has been mo mostly focused on exports, but in this area there's a, a whole bunch of imports as well. And, uh, that's got to be part of the conversation and the equation. Um, also left out is the, the, the notion that we're not generating a whole bunch of new customers. Uh, the Millersburg site um, allows for both from Medford and from Klamath Falls a one-day turnaround, a, an eight-hour trip, which, which is attractive uh, to shippers in southern Oregon, I would hope. You go further north, it's a two-day trip, it's twice the labor, it gets complicated. Uh, we've also included in the executive summary a substantial industrial park revenue. Uh, the site is much bigger than just a reload facility. We've got uh, rail companies ready to enter into land leases uh, as soon as we're approved. Uh, they bring hundreds of jobs with them and uh, revenue to help ensure that this thing actually works. 
Uh, the last thing I'd say before I, I went over my minute 20, <laughs> sorry, um, is that there's talk about wanting to get actuals. You can't have actuals till you actually do business. So uh, while I appreciate um, the due diligence by everybody to this point, uh, we feel like we're ready to go and we're looking for a way to be able to have a conversation about that detailed business plan we have and do it in a way that's meaningful to all of you and your staff and yet respect, respects the proprietary information of the business people involved. So with that, I turn it over to the project manager, Greg Smith. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Again, my name is Greg Smith. Uh, once again, we agree with uh, the prior assessments that have been completed by ODOT staff and your freight advisory committee and your citizen final review team and director Garrett. And I'd also add the Port of Portland who uh, have stepped up and said, these are challenging projects. There's a lot of questions, there's risk. But in the end, we believe that the project in Millersburg is the one that should be selected. We thank uh, everyone for that. And we concur with Tioga Group's um, issues and concerns. We think they're legitimate. Um, what I'd share with you once again is a few areas where perhaps we can bring clarity and uh, also bring some context. First, I wanna share with you that a thorough, an over 1,000 page environmental assessment has been done on that property. It came back and said, other than a little thing here, a little thing there, it's clean. I personally have reached out and verified that DEQ has no cleanup issues listed. They had zero history. We actually then went and talked to the legal counsel of the sellers of the property and said, we're going to do due diligence. We're moving to a phase two on this. Is there anything I need to know about now? They said, you're good. Don't worry. So I want to share that and get that on the record. Second, second thing I want to share with you is under the, uh, and again, colleagues, I'm going off with the commissioners are going off of this. Um, I want to, I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up. Um, under the public subsidy offered, uh, we think it is extraordinarily strong that Lynn County has said that we're in this thing for 10%. If you put that over 10 years, their annual contribution, should it be necessary, they're in to help keep the lights on. Uh, I don't believe that's going to be necessary the way we're going to structure this deal. But the notion that should we have a, um, a need, we've got a backstop. Second, I would share with you, um, as we move up the changing railroad business model, we took a hard look at both the Portland Western and the Union Pacific. And if you look at the way our property lies, this property is served by both railroads. It's right there with the industrial right in between and Interstate 5. And one of the things that we realized is that there's nothing that we can do at our, or that other facilities, future, current facilities can do that we can't do. The challenge is this. We found Union Pacific is not willing to allow certain paper obstacles to be released. And hence, it would be very challenging for us to make that work. In addition, we found and again, this is no reflection because there's lots of great ideas out there. We found that there were some height restriction issues that would reduce our ability to do double stacks through. The final thing we found is Union Pacific looked at us, said, you bring in competition and we're out. Okay, and so one of the issues we had to be really careful of, because in my original view is we're going to have Burlington Northern, we're going to have UP, we're going to have options. And both railroads looked at us and said it's one or the other. And... Uh, um, that's what we found. Now, others may be able to do something different, but that's where we are. And so uh, why we got a little fair mark there, I would just point out, we have the capacity to do it, but it wasn't in our economic interest. And so I hope you would uh, consider that. Um, I want to go uh, next to the potential catalyst and talk about the city of Millersburg. The city of Millersburg, across the street, um, from the IP property is sitting on over 400 acres of industrially zoned land that's adjacent to the Portland Western. Lane County, Ledge, the city of Millersburg 
have wrapped their arms around one another and have said, how can we collaborate to make this work? And so in terms of additional opportunities, uh, I will share with you, I have spoken to two companies in the last 30 days, both who need rail service, both of whom, if I told you the names, you would be impressed. Yesterday, my team met with one of these that is going to create 90 jobs at $58,000 a year, and they want to be there. And in one hour, two hours, I'm calling them to share with them. I don't share this to, to position. I didn't mean that. It kind of came across that way. But I'm sharing with you the economic opportunities that are coming with this are significant. The biggest challenge we're going to have as it relates to this real estate is making sure we get the highest and best use for different locations. There's not a lot of spots left in the Willamette Valley that have industrially zoned land with two railroads and an interstate. Finally, I'd share with you the city of Millersburg welcomes industrial development. They welcome a project of this nature. Last thing, um, Madam Chair, in my 15 seconds, similar to other comments I shared on a previous project, we've tried our best to put the very best team together. We know of no one else but Northwest Container that knows this area, knows this region, and can help us move commodities north. We've worked with 1,000 friends. We've worked with Union Pacific. Union Pacific executives walked that site. They would not have wrote that letter if they didn't believe we could make this work. We've retained Eco Northwest, and ironically, we have Portland Western and Teven Brothers ready to handle our bulk commodity movements on the Portland Western. Containers on UP, bulk commodities, Port Portland Western. We have that ready to go. Um, we'd ask for your support. We fully understand uh, this needs to be done in stages, um, but we would ask for your support. We're ready to move forward. And I'm offering a little extra grace for the wonderful things that you said about Director Garrett. Well, thank so, you for that. I don't have what I, can I get a stick? Then, <laughs> okay, questions in this particular project? Please. So in under Connect Oregon, you can only um, pay for a property that is needed for the project area, and then this site is actually larger. So how are you going to come up with the, the difference of the cost of that property? In the purchasing. Yeah, so I would share with you, uh, anyone who's going to be doing with, dealing with unit trains has to have the ability to, uh, uh, to have approximately one mile of trackage. That's kind of the minimum limitation you need. And then in addition, you are not allowed to have any um, excess rail cars sitting on the main line. Union Pacific will not allow that, so they have to get moved off. And so uh, the international paper site... Um, is ideal for that uh, type of activity. The property on the other side of the ground, on the other side, owned by the city of Millersburg, was donated to the city. And so uh, there's no debt on that. The city will own that property. Ledge will own the IP property. But through a collaborative agreement, um, they'll work together. Please. Commissioner Nyquist, you mentioned something about uh, talking to shippers and uh, have commitments, or one of you two gentlemen did. If you had to go to the loan committee of a financial institution, you would have to disclose a whole lot more than you have here. And while I do not believe ODOT and the OTC is risk averse, we have to see a real return on investment, as Commissioner Van Brocklin has mentioned, that benefits the state and the taxpayers. And I have concerns about that. So, so if I might, the, the difference would be if I were going to a loan committee, the documents wouldn't be public record and eligible to be on the front page of the newspaper the next day, which would cause me operational problems. I understand that. but. You know, well, we have to look at it so, from a hard no standpoint. So we're we're happy to do that, and we're able we're happy to share that with with you and or with staff in whatever form we can do that in without uh, releasing proprietary information uh, of those companies. And I think I'm not an attorney, but I think there are provisions in the RSS to address this issue. Yeah, I would share uh, Chair Bainey and Commissioner. 
uh, Oregon Revised Statute does allow for the handling of confidential information once you hit a certain point. Right. And so sh should we be successful and be able to go under contract, one of the things we would be able to do is enter into a stage gate process of which we then could formalize that and bring it back um, for review and concurrence. But right now, um, we're not capable of doing that. Okay. Commissioner Brown, did you have another question? No, I just thought that was interesting. Okay. Yeah. Right, so I, I will be asking DOJ to address this maybe between the two before we switch out. Um, I think it's an important point of mm -hmm. contention that we, in order for us to get the information that we need. Yeah, Chair so, Bainey, I would share with you, we know how important that is. That's why right on the record we're saying we concur, we know. We're just, we're at this juggernaut where we can't sure. get it until we get to a different okay. place in the process. Well, and I think it's probably underscores the struggle that we are having as well. Right. So, um, so other questions for this particular proposal? Okay, can, thank can you. Thank Please. you, Madam Chair. One other thing that I think is really important based upon the, the Tioga study is I think it's really important to understand truckers already have the option to try to go to Terminal 6 or to go to the port of port or to a Northwest Container. I would ask you folks, and I've done it, at 7 in the morning, go up to those neighborhoods. Hmm. Go up there. The reason they're bypassing there is because it's not any faster at Terminal 6 or at Northwest Container to take your trucks there. There'll be 300 trucks lined up. Lined up on the side of the road there. I think it's Columbia Boulevard. Mm -hmm. I'm from Eastern Oregon. Mm -hmm. Columbia. And uh, so for them, that's not the option. They, for, they want our use or they're just going to drive it all the way up. Right, so Thank we you. think oh, truckers we, would... I'm in a, sorry, Commissioner. Thank I, you. Yes, need Thank to respect much. the process. Sorry. Okay, and as you can tell, I'm offering a little grace. So not too much grace, but a bit. So, and especially if you have kind things to say about Director Garrett, you can have an ex... <laughs> so, Mr. Mannix, your um, button is not quite on yet. Let's make... Jackie, could we make sure that his microphone is on and... Um, Wonderful. Great to see you all, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Yes. Chair Bainey, members of the commission, Commissioner and Director Garrett, thank you for your service. And we'll stick around to hear some more fun things, I'm sure, at the end of this session. <laughs> I'm Kevin Mannix. I'm an attorney from Salem. I'm also the executive director of the Oregon Port of Willamette. In a moment, I'm going to introduce Jonathan Lefebvre's, but I cannot resist starting out by saying that the object here is not to make money. The object here is to reduce congestion on our highways and to reduce carbon emissions and to have more efficient use of fossil fuels. That was the objective of the legislature. We have focused on that in our project. And if you want to talk about trucks backed up in Portland in neighborhoods, our facility will be open 24 hours a day seven days a week with the particular purpose of drawing in as many of those trucks as possible. And unlike Millersburg, which will provide a parking lot for trucks that are going to T6, we want those trucks to come to Brooks and to send everything by rail. Take a look at their plan. It's a parking lot for T6 and a shuttle for Northwest Container Services. We want to capture all of the truck traffic as much as possible, but we will need to come back to you and establish that we have an economically viable rate and structure plan. And as, as you know, we've requested some additional time because we finally found a breakthrough in the last couple of weeks working with BNSF and UP to get closer to some actual rate structure. With that, I'm going to hand this over to Jonathan Lefevers, who is the president of CIS. Thank you very much, Chair Beatty. Thank you uh, to, the, to the panel here. Um, I would say that we share your frustration. Uh, a lot of this process is um, it's in a condensed time frame, I think, for a lot of what these customers and, and companies are used to operating in. And it's been extremely difficult to ascertain real numbers um, because we've got to get back to the steamship lines and the customers and be able to speak very logically about what we're trying to propose here and, and develop a value proposition. What we're, what we're looking to do here, and I think where I agree with most of what the Tioga report says, but I think there's definitely some points that we have, you know, maybe a little bit of issue with. We're looking to develop a comprehensive supply chain solution. We don't want to generalize this and, and, and 
boil this down to competitiveness of trucks between Portland to areas in central Oregon. We think that's an oversimplification of a very complex issue. Each railroad has a very different methodology about the way they operate business, and I think you know Mr. Smith pointed that out, the way their customer bases work, et cetera. Those approaches and those due diligence efforts and the value proposition that you have to put forth to those people are very different, and so you're basically running two projects concurrently. It's roughly the same information, but it has to be delivered in a different way. So we have been spending a lot of time with this, and really on a daily basis, we've been in contact with uh, the short line with the, the Portland and Western, um, and an ongoing discussion with both BN and UP. UP has agreed to uh, fund some or provide some rates to us next week. Um, it's part of the reason we're asking for the extension. Uh, this new information that we've discovered um, is going to allow us now to go back to the steamship lines and go back to these customers that we have been very actively communicating with now for weeks and months and speak to those guys in very clear terms about what we're going to uh, accomplish here. Um, in that time, too, we've learned that, that as well, the location of Brooks is preferred over Millersburg. Uh, they, they seek that close, close proximity to Portland is important in, in order to capture enough import containers to fund the export activity. We are fo focusing our model on making sure there is always more export demand for the containers and there as actually import consumption. So that way containers don't get stuck in Brooks. Um, finally, as we go through all this, um, we have what we need now to have these very substantial uh, conversations. Pricing is going to be available to us next week, and I think Kevin makes a great point of us being open 24 by 7. When you talk about rail schedules and, and availability of service, that is going to be a critical value proposition that we're going to put to these customers that they can deliver containers to us at any time and that we can match those those shipments up once they're in our possession to available rail schedules. Um, so with all that, I'll turn it back to Kevin, but we're, we're very excited about the developments here in the last two weeks. Two figures for you, 30,000 trucks a year. It's in our material. The legislature thought it would be great if we could reduce 30,000 trucks a year going up and down our highways. I called 23 shippers personally and spoke to them and documented talking to them that we would be able to bring 42,000, we up to figure, 42,430 containers for export into our facility. Yes, we have to be cost competitive in order to do that, but if we're doing that, they want to use our facility rather than be trucking up to Seattle Tacoma or trucking into Portland. And if you consider the haulback, that means we're talking about 84,860 truck trips through Portland and many of them up and down the Willamette Valley. We are focused on that. Now, I listed it by Farmer A, Business B, and the, and, the, and the like. How do we provide that confidential information to you? Well, really, what we'll do is we'll take it to the railroads and we're going to show it to them as part of our business plan. However, if ODOT and the Commission wants to document this, we can come in, I can check about getting permission to reveal the names of some of these companies. But more importantly, now that we understand that you want even more specific information, because as of 4.32 p.m. last Friday afternoon, we saw that Tioga was saying they needed to see that, we will go back to these shippers and many others and ask, all right, what are the rates that you're paying right now? Because we didn't ask. We just asked with, you know, if we're competitive. We will get that additional documentation, but we're going to need some time to do that. In the meantime, our modus operandi right now is to encourage everyone to understand that we're here in terms of, yes, I'll use the word visionary, a visionary approach to transportation, which looks at the goals that the legislature set, but also takes a practical approach. I wrote down a quote from the beginning of this meeting. Now is not a time for modest ambition. We admit to being ambitious about what we're trying to do. We are not trying to build more shipping business. It's already there. We are trying to take that shipping business and put it on rail and be part of a transportation network that will help the rest of the state. As part of our ambition, we want to help the international port of Coos Bay. We've been talking to the Port of Coos Bay. We're aware of all the work that they've done to improve their rail line running into the valley. The Portland and Western Railroad line, which is right by our facility that we intend to use, runs right down and with a little Union Pacific gap, connects up with the Coos Bay rail line. We want to see the Port of Coos Bay have container shipping capability for the future, and we want to be an interior port or an inland port working with them. So there is a facility that feeds 
cargo to them and brings cargo in. We also think Eugene ought to be involved in this too, north and south parts of the valley. We're trying to think about all these factors. When we did our response yesterday at 4.45 p.m., um, we were also responding to some factors that ODOT cited in a report they gave to us on Tuesday. I would love to sit down with the ODOT administrators who came up with that report. We've responded in writing to all of their 18 points, but I think when I looked through that, that there was nothing there about the big picture, about the congestion issue, about the carbon emissions, about how we're going to connect with another port facility for the future. All of those things are in the hands of this commission, but we understand and we ask that we be given the opportunity to come back and present to you more detail, having now a deeper engagement with Union Pacific as we evidenced even by the email we provided to you today, where now we've got some traction going and we'll have some information next week that we can work with with the Portland and Western, but we will also be pursuing the Burlington and Northern. We've had, we've gone to Fort Worth. We've talked to them there. I mean, we've physically gone there. We've been meeting with them. But this stuff took time, and I'm sorry that we don't have that information today, but if it's 30 days, I think we can do it. We asked for 90, but you know, uh, that was our proposal. <coughs> but we think that we could come back to the next commission meeting and say, all right, here is